Hello, Internet. Gino, that Pinguino Greco here again with another episode of Deep Listens. Joining me, as always, is Billy horror movie hater Rothert. All right. At least I'm not being called a murderer or the grind father. Math or the magician. math magician. Yeah. Maybe that's why he hates horror movies. He's just like, oh, I could have killed this person so much better. That's true. Maybe he identifies with the monsters, and then at the end, when they're defeated, he's like, oh, I totally wouldn't have gone down like that. It's got to be one game where the monsters just wreck everybody. It's called Actually, Rampage. Until yeah. Dawn. Could be that game. Um, well, hello, yeah. everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. My name is Billy Rother, a.k.a. Rothgar, in just about any gaming circle you've seen or played with me or heard of me in. Um, happy to be back. Yep, our resident completionist. And that sultry, deep voice you heard was Peter... The Wendigo Hunter Busby. What's going on, everybody? Fun Thanksgiving fact for you all. We've modified turkeys to the point where they cannot reproduce on their own anymore. They need our help to do so. So enjoy your Thanksgiving, depending on when you listen to this, I guess. They will hopefully have enjoyed their Thanksgiving and not have I you hope ruin you enjoy it. enjoy your artificially inseminated turkey then. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and today we have a special guest for this special episode. Um, Tyler Morgan, our resident, I guess not resident, but a friend of ours, a game developer, or in training, I suppose. But welcome. You yeah, glad to be on here, Gino. Yeah, so um, this week we're going to be discussing Until Dawn. Um, we did not have any... A long-ass podcast, Gino. Ha-ha. <laughs> right, jokes. Oh, God. Well, I guess yeah. we have to start this podcast over now. I have to <laughs> delete this file so that no one ever hears it. Um, so... This episode, Until Dawn, we did not get too much feedback from last episode. If you want to reach out to the podcast, go ahead and hit up at that pinguino on Twitter, that pinguino at gmail.com, or we have a comments section on our uh, podcast page, deeplistens.libsyn.com. So Basically, with, just talk to us. Yeah, I mean, you don't have, like, it's just polite if you're in a room with someone to, like, engage them in conversation every once in a while. Whatever. Um, but until dawn, so Tyler, you were the person who suggested this game, and I, I did. feel like as the person who suggested it, why why did you want to have us play this game today? Well, until dawn does a lot of things. Interestingly, that is a word. Yes, no. Yes. Yes. He's made up words every podcast, so you can totally <laughs> make up Say whatever words. you want. Oh, excellent! Yeah, um, it does a lot of things in an interesting manner. It kind of is representing the. Uh, return of story-driven, quote-unquote, adventure games to the AAA industry, which is an exciting trend, if nothing else. And it does a lot of things right and a good number of things wrong. So, it... Yeah, it's kind of pissed off Billy. <laughs> That's true. I was a little bit angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think it's really interesting to see, because with adventure games with a lot of dialogue components, I'm used to the Telltale model. And it's interesting to see a similar style of game in terms of execution, but done by someone with completely different sensibilities. Um, this game is as much a teen horror movie as anything I've ever seen. And I, Billy, you said you did not especially enjoy that. Why don't we? You're the horror movie hater. Maybe we should get that out of the way first. Why do you hate horror movies so much? All right. So I don't like films in the horror genre because I find them to be predictable. I find they're writing to be just subpar i find their character development to be shallow at best and <clears throat> and their use of tropes over and over and over again i think takes away from any real innovation in the genre itself because people say like oh we should do like friday the 13th stuff or we should do saw stuff or we should do you know dawn of the dead stuff it, you can almost always take any horror film made in the last 10 years or whatever and trace it back to a predecessor that's basically already been made by somebody else. Those are some of the things that I have wrong with the genre, and I think this game does does a lot of that. Hey, hey Pete. Mm. Um, lineages of like literature and being able to trace literature back to earlier versions, mm -hmm. that's pretty normal in like literature, right? Yeah, there's a word for it. It's uh, it's called an illusion. You make an illusion. I know what an illusion is, but like there's a there's a difference. Okay, so when I think about a story being 
an epic tale like Beowulf or Gilgamesh were epic tales, that's yeah. fine. But I want them to do something new and innovative while they pay homage to maybe a previous archetype of storytelling. But well, Beowulf I feel like, ripped tons what? of stuff, old stories. <clears throat> like Beowulf, I'm, I'm sure they like all a ripped series stuff. of plot points the way he goes through. So, like, sure, maybe in literature, this is perfectly fine. But we're not talking about just literature. This is a game. And I yeah. think I'm going to talk about a game. If I'm going to talk about this as a genre, I'm talking about a game like it's the marriage of storytelling and visual experience and, like, sprinkle on all their aesthetics, too, that makes this totally new package. Now, one of the things that – so you said it's very formulaic. Uh, Until Dawn, I assume you think – also falls into this category, right? A yes. very formulaic I was plot. able to predict almost everything that okay. would happen in the game. So do you think that the gameplay element of it kind of subverts some of those um, expectations, some of those plot points that you expect <clears> to see? Because as soon as I started playing, I don't know about you guys, I've seen a horror movie or two. Teen horror movie is pretty good. Right, um, the person who has sex is supposed to die. They're supposed yeah. to die. They're supposed to die first. They're supposed to die gruesomely to teach you that sex is bad. And then they go straight to hell, yeah. Yeah, they go straight to hell the way they're supposed to. Yeah. Um, in this game, that could happen. It's actually very easy for that to happen. But it can also not happen, depending on how you play the game. And that was something that really struck me, was how many of the horror movie tropes are set up. And if you play the game kind of an ordinary way and are not super careful, it is very easy for this game to follow a traditional teen horror plot. But if you make the right decisions and play the game correctly, you can actually create a more interesting story than the one that an ordinary horror movie would follow. Like, is there a way to play a game correctly? Well, it, if you follow the, a certain series of events, you can end up with everyone living. If you follow a different set of events, everyone can die. And then depending on uh, how you played certain events, you can have characters who don't even survive until later in the game. And so, for example, Jessica, who is... The person who was going to have she was going to have sex. Yeah, she was. <laughs> and so, as the person who was going to have sex, and as the girl, because of course the girl who has sex is the person who's going to get killed. Um, oh, and the man is the quote unquote hero of the game. Yes. So he, she, is very easy for her to die in the first like three or four chapters, and then she's just gone from the rest of the game, and. Because it's so easy for her to die, I feel almost as though that is the uh, – it's not intended necessarily. It's not an authorial intent. But when it's leaned so heavily in that direction, I feel like it's almost authorial intent. Maybe, Tyler, you might have some insight into this. Like, what do you think? Like, in terms of weighing choices and stuff like that so that players usually follow a given path but have the option to um, break that path if they make the right decisions – what do you think in terms of authorial intent and whether that counts or not? Well, with regards to Jessica's character um, in particular, she's still almost written out of the story either way. Um, yes. So I played through the game twice, once on my own in the seclusion of my living room, and then the second time um, on a stream with a bunch of my friends from school. And so uh, in that stream, I divvied up the characters to different people, right? And I, I gave a couple people two characters because characters like Jess are – nearly written out of the plot after a certain point that um, the friend I had play her character was a little bit sour about it because um, after about two chapters of playing her, most of which is throwing a couple snowballs, the, um, there's, <laughs> the character really doesn't actually have any more chapters. So she's almost gone either way. <laughs> um, yeah. And, but, yeah, I guess they, they kind of hedge their bets there by just, even if you save her, she's such a non-factor in the story for the most part. But I feel like at least being able to save her, and Matt is the other character who is very, very easy to lose early on in the story. And he, once he, if he survives, he also jumps like, and is gone for nine chapters or something, you know, for the mm -hmm. next five or six chapters until he shows up for like a three-minute segment at the end of the game. And so... He's the kind of dumb jock character who you expect it. He seems hyper capable, but really, he's kind of dumb. He's they play him up like he's dumb. I don't know that he ever shows that he's dumb, but everyone around him treats him kind of like he's dumb. Who matter, Chris? Matt. Chris Matt is dumb. Mike. 
Matt. The, Matt's the the character with the Letterman jacket. Who, yeah, 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 Matt. Yeah, so him and Jessica both fall into the tropes of the people who would get killed early in a horror movie, and the game sort of sets expects you to lose them early on. And if you don't, they just kind of leave the story for like five, six chapters, and then they show up and have one more opportunity to die near the end. Um, but if they survive, I found it pretty interesting seeing them getting what's interviewed. Matt, what's, what's Matt's early chance to die? Um, Emily, the tower? There's a few. Um, Emily, first at the at the tower. Um, actually, I don't think he can die when the tower collapses. He, I, he I dies right sure he after. If, if you um, get to the tower and it collapses, um, he can die trying to save Emily. He can also die when the uh, elks surround him. If he tries to attack them with a with an axe, oh, they'll yeah, charge him again. Yeah, they can kill him. There's, there seems like there's an interesting paradox here, though, Gene, and sort of the things you're describing. Sort of, if you want more people to get the subversion of the genre, you make it comparably easy for them to survive, right? Mm-hmm. That way the more people will accomplish. But in making it easier, that devalues that subversion. So if you want the subversion to be significant, it should be difficult, but then you run the risk of fewer people actually getting it, right? So there seems to be a paradox here, and I guess it would make sense, right? between accessibility and significance of these sort of in-game moments. Yeah, and another issue is just when you are writing, it is very difficult to create assets for these two characters who can very easily die in the first three or four chapters and then have them flow through the rest of the game when you know 90% of your player base never sees that content mm-hmm. unless they replay or unless they're using a guide. And mm-hmm. so it creates a really interesting production, pri- uh, production pipeline problem where are we going to spend all this time and energy and resources creating these sequences for these characters who we expect will be dead for most players? Um, And so it kind of hamstrings the developers when you say, okay, we're going to make this fork. They might live, they might die. Um, If they die, well, they're just written out of the story. And if they live, are we going to create all this content that no one sees? No, we should probably just have a little bit of content near the end. That's the only way this is going to work. And so it creates this circumstance that Tyler described where even if they survive it's almost like they didn't except for a few interviews at the end and a short sequence where they can die again they have another opportunity to die Um, I don't think they even necessarily find anything that other characters couldn't have found if they survive their sequences yeah I can't think of any character who could die early and then they get a solo scene later you know what I mean like Matt, the, Matt probably does because he gets a little bit of time in like the cave before he finds Jessica, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who else could die early? Emily could die, not early, but kind of kind of midway through, right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> there's like there's a lot of opportunities for Chris to die, but the only times when he's really alone is when he's with the uh, the old flamethrower guy. Yeah, and he can't even die there. I don't think he can, he can die. die there. He, he can, can die coming back from. No, he's he, running no, back, he, right? He can die there with flamethrower guy. A Wendigo can can eat. His yeah, face. if you fail the don't move QTE, you, you get his head fucking ripped off. Okay, don't he can get Wendigo. <laughs> that was worse than my pun, man. Was it? I think so. Okay, fair enough. So going through the game, I definitely didn't get the impression that it was as linear as it actually turned out to be. Um, The structure of it, when you go back and look at it, is really they know that Sam and Mike will survive until the very end. And so they base the entirety of the story around those characters with everyone else just kind of um, serving secondary roles. And would you say would you say not Chris and Ashley? I would say they're secondary because they can definitely survive a lot long. It's easier to make them survive. I I felt like those four had a much more significant jump from so easy to die to probably could live if you made a couple right decisions. I feel like if there's there's eight playable characters, if you don't include one of the twins at the very start of the game in the tutorial level, there's eight playable characters, and I feel like four are like so likely to die, hard to keep alive, and four are pretty easy to keep alive. And I feel like Ashley and Chris are in the four that are easily kept alive, and the other four are are hard, are pretty easy to die. The, the QTE for Chris coming back from the um, date with the flamethrower guy is a little bit 
tough. That's, like it, it slows really down just enough that you kind of have to push really hard. And if you change your mind between the flamethrower and the Wendigo at the very end, you'll just die. So like they, they were prepared for him to die. <laughs> yeah. I was prepared for him to die, but he, he didn't for me. Uh, and they definitely give Ashley a few opportunities to, to dive off of, if you're not really thinking like, Hey, I hear a voice. Go investigate voice or don't investigate voice. And my horror movie senses, there were plenty of times where my horror movie senses just tingled. I'm like, should I investigate the voice? Should I leave this person behind? No, no. When you say your horror movie senses tingled, for me, that was like, I can predict what's happening and I really don't have to make a hard decision now. And it took a little bit away for me from the game. Yeah. And I think it, it definitely builds on the genre. Like, you expect certain characters to go through certain sequences because of who they are. Like Emily, she clearly was going to be put into a life or death situation with how she's treating everyone else. Like eventually there's just going to be a people turn on her sequence because she's, she very easily can slap people like all day in this story. I feel like the criticism you're making, Billy, maybe I'm reading this from more of a film perspective as opposed to a gaming perspective. I'm talking about a film perspective. All right, well, then let me give you an analogy, right? Sure. All the criticisms you made of horror films could pretty much be applied to pornography as well. You're right. But nobody makes these criticisms of pornography, really, because they're beside the point. That's not what you watch pornography for. I'd say in horror movies, it's sort of the same way, right? Like, these are legitimate criticisms, but they're sort of beside the point. Isn't it ironic, then, that we call... Films like Hostel or Saw, Torture Porn. Torture Porn, yeah, I was going to say Gornography, would either one work. Gornography, yeah. Torture Porn, whatever you want to what call I'm it. That's what I'm saying, yeah. A lot of the criticism you're making, I think, are beside the point for this genre. All right, so then again, yeah, you, you, you do make a solid like counter-argument. Thank you. Um, if I had to push back a little bit harder, I would say, like, why, why are we here to, like, why watch films, right? Why watch films? Are we going to have to separate horror films from a story that we actually care about the parts of the story and the plot progression for almost every other genre? But for this, oh, no, we only care about the jump scares. So we're not going to call it films anymore. We're going to call it motion jump scare pictures. Like, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, right? So That's it makes my new more... indie movie. Motion, <laughs> jump, jump, scare scare pictures. motion jump scare pictures. Like. Fair well, enough. some some genres are comfort food, and it's not even genre. Sometimes there are low quality horror movies that are they're called B movies because they follow right. a scheduled yeah. script. They have a relatively low budget. We know what the return is going to be because it has an established brand. It's in a genre that's very formulaic, and so people are kind of going in expecting it to follow the formula, and they're not necessarily looking for subversion. Um, it's really the high end horror movies like uh, the Babadook and some of those the type Bob. things. That movie's pretty good. Yeah. Um, I couldn't get through it. Really? It was too scary? Or No, the kid. The kid just annoyed me too oh, much, yeah, the, which was the, kid the point. But... He, is a, he is annoying. But um, there's a few horror movies that really subvert, but every year there will be 9 to 10. Crump, Crumpus is coming out, and we know what that movie's going to be. We know what that movie's going to be, but, you know, sometimes you're just in for Crumpus. Sometimes you're in for Crumpus There's the goddamn yeah, yeah. Chucky Krampus. movies. Yep. And I, Chucky one was actually not bad. Then every subsequent movie was just making fun of itself over and over again. Yep, and it's it's sometimes it gets masturbatory, and sometimes we're back we're back again. We're really carrying this metaphor pretty far. <laughs> but sometimes the formula is part of it. And do you guys think it was successful as kind of a Until Dawn was successful as kind of a horror movie? Like, did it scare you at any point? I don't want to be the one who keeps talking, but. I was only scared for jump scares. And I think that's the cheapest version of jump scare. Because this game, which said when they were releasing the game, like pre-release, I said, hey, look, this is going to be the kind of game you have to play through multiple times to get it right. We're going to have this butterfly effect undertone. I mean, I don't know. Overtone. Undertone, overtone, right? Butterfly effect overtone throughout the game and say, hey, look, we're going to give you the option to replay critical chapters after you play your first playthrough. This is, this is going to encourage replayability. And for me, all of the stuff that actually scared me never scared me again for the replay. It made the replay not that good. Let's throw it back to other game examples like a Resident Evil game or a Silent Hill game. First or, Bioshock game. 
or the, yeah, the first Bioshock. Fair that stuff nice. is still scary because of the atmosphere, the tension. Like it's still it's still scary because of the fear you have of the not fear, but the tension that's created by music and lighting and surroundings and everything. And this game lacked in that for me. Yeah, there's not snowy a... forest trail can only be so scary. And Cabin with the lights turned off can only be so scary. It, it it's it doesn't do it for me. And there's also the fact that there's no unknown in Until Dawn. True. There was definitely well, a tension for there me. There was an unknown for the first half of the game until it gets revealed in the second half of the game. There's fucking Wendigo running. I mean around. in replays, like You're right. In Silent Hill games, there is still a sense of unknown if you don't memorize all the enemy locations. Like there's always something lurking out there in the fog that you might not be aware of. In a Bioshock game, you might not know where every single splicer is. And there are splicers that are walking around on an AI routine that might be in a different place than you expect. With Until Dawn, there are beats. Those beats will always happen the way that they happen the first time. And unless you go into a divergent path with a really different sequence, like if you didn't save Jessica and then you save Jessica and then see her later, what happens to her later on, um, there are just going to be sequences that you know up and down. And so they aren't as scary anymore. Like so I the dollhouse throw, scared me the first time, not the second. I want to throw a question kind of Tyler's way um, here because he's probably the closest to a – like a real, like a real, he's, he's, he's probably going to have the closest insight to real game making right now. <clears throat> um, so the first, maybe like three or four chapters of the game, certain characters have to live. There are ways that characters, like you can make the worst decisions possible and they still live. Mm -hmm. All you lose is maybe like a little bit of relationship status or maybe somebody makes a, makes a mean comment to you later because you dropped their luggage in the snow or something. I don't, I don't know. Fucking trivial things, right? You mm -hmm. can make the worst decisions in the game for like the first four chapters and everyone lives still. And the reason that happens is because they have to get the characters to certain plot points or else they can't tell a story. Mm -hmm. Now, this is either a good decision or a real, I guess, like cheapening of a would-be cool mechanic. If they're trying to say to you, decisions really matter in this game. Pay close attention. Like, that's what the opening sequence said. Your decisions matter. Some of these decisions are going to be irrevocable. You cannot go back on these decisions until you, beat, until you beat the game. Don't make the first four chapters every decision is actually meaningless. Well, here's a question I want to ask. Or, let me just finish the whole okay. thought. Or, were they just taking an extra long time to put training wheels on the character and say, hey, look, these decisions matter a little bit. You're going to have good or bad relationship. Wait until parts two and three, like the second and third thirds of the story, for people to actually live or die based on your decisions. What do you think, Tyler? Yeah, I mean, I think it's all in the pacing of the game. Um, I really enjoyed the pacing of it, and delaying the um, major effects certainly make the production budget a lot easier, right? I can see a producer freaking out when you tell them that Characters can die in the first 30 minutes, and that has branching effects and affects every dialogue tree throughout. Um, yeah, so the contrast that I find interesting here is between Until Dawn and the Telltale games, right? Both games that claim that your decisions matter and really put a lot of stock in that. But because of the way that they are produced, they end up... A reasonable amount different. So Telltale games will tend to have one or two major branching points in every chapter that affect whether or not a character is living or the status of your <clears throat> group, um, and then just have a bunch of smaller um, conversation options that color people's opinions of you but don't actually branch the game's logic in any way other than the occasional dialogue option. Right, right. Uh, until Dawn kind of takes the Heavy Rain model, and Heavy Rain is probably the most um, analogous example, although I think Heavy Rain did it a bit better, because in that game, um, all four of the primary characters have the potential to die, and then just don't show up to the last few chapters, um, which branches in a bunch of different ways. But Until Dawn follows its um, two central character core narrative all the way through no matter what, and um, the other characters ultimately just become set dressing who may or may not be present for the finale. 
Because I'm pretty sure Be- uh, Sam and Mike like cannot die until really far into the game, right? The yeah, last neither scene. one can die until the final scene. Yeah. I believe. I think you're right. Yeah, and so that leads me to this question. Does it matter that... So does that Wait, mean... Can Mike die in the asylum? No, he can't. He's getting he chased can, by... He can get maimed, but he can't die. Yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. Um, are we making maybe being a little bit too broad in our uh, distinction that death is the only change that matters? Um, that if a character is dead, that's the only thing that really changes the game. Because for me, um, I watched a playthrough of Until Dawn where um, Sam, in the very first scene went into Chris's backpack, and then Chris did not trust her from then on. And um, I also saw a playthrough where uh, Matt sided with Jessica instead of siding with Emily. And the experience of playing Matt when he's with Emily, if you side with not Emily, is a really different experience, (laughs) radically different than if you side with Emily. You're right. If you side with her, she is pretty cool. She's actually fairly nice to him. Like, she'll freak out at moments where it makes sense for her to freak out, but otherwise she is not super-duper snipey. Their, like, dating relationship could fall apart if you mess that up. Yes, and so I, in my playthrough, like, did not let Matt know that Emily was talking to um, Mike. I did not have Matt argue with Emily. And so that whole narrative branch was a lot different. Like, I liked Emily in this playthrough. But in the playthrough I saw, I hated her. Um, And so my response to this one character was completely colored by stuff that would be a trivial decision if all we value is death um, and the presence of characters. But I think the experience of having these characters have very different personalities and very different opinions of each other actually added more to my experience than whether they were there or not, like, at the end. I enjoyed the game a lot more because of the variety of character reactions, not necessarily the variety of ways they can die. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And I think um, the reason we tend to put so much value on death, and not, not just because it's pivotal to the you know genre that Until Dawn is doing, but because that is the one variable which we know could flip either way, that we see completely transparently, right? You know, you know, or um, a lot of people have the perception going in that all of the characters can either live or die based on your decisions, but you have no idea whether or to what degree the dialogue paths would branch. So we don't really have any comparison to make in just one playthrough about how the dialogue could be different, um, which leads to putting value on death, the one thing that we can be sure of can any dialogue branch cause a player's death yes um if you aim a gun at ashley so it she won't die there um when you're chris um, yeah but uh, she won't that's, trust i you. wouldn't call that a dialogue event i would um, call that a dialogue like you saying you say something so mean to somebody their heart explodes like no, no i mean happen, but. <laughs> like that's part of what i had a problem with all of the death all the chances for a character to die come from you either acting or failing to act not a not a not a dialogue choice and if you're talking about the scene where chris and ashley are in the like the the chair and there's like a saw or something coming down on them and he has to shoot her or not shoot her Mm -hmm. and he doesn't know that there's blanks in the gun but it makes her not trust him so she'll not open the door for him and then he'll get killed i wouldn't call that a character lives or dies based on a dialogue because Mike has the same choice when he could or could not kill Emily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's not an incident. If, if that's the definition, no, there's not an incidental dialogue decision that ultimately butterfly effects into someone dying. There are big, you know, when you're making a choice when someone's going to die, but you never, you tend not to know what the effects of your seemingly incidental actions will have. Like for example, I found a bat at one point and by finding that bat, I was then later able to, as Sam, when she was escaping the psycho, use that bat to escape. Um, I was also able to, you know, look but looking at Chris's phone there. or not. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. Like that right, allowed her to matter. escape. No, but it, it made my experience very different. She actually right. never got caught for me. Um, mm-hmm. Sam escaped, and I got an entirely new sequence where she walks around the psycho's lair because she wasn't caught. Um, 
and that was pretty big. I like for example, I was able to learn who Doctor Hill was because Sam was able to escape um, the site. He found the cell phone or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And so that that added to my experience. I didn't know that sequence even existed, um, and I watched an entire playthrough. So, I think that those branching events, like I thought, I was used to seeing Chris not trust Sam, and so mm-hmm. when I got to experience Chris trusting Sam, it felt like a different experience. Um, that I'll give the game makers credit for. Like they did something cool with character relationships. What I wish could have happened was you have a conversation with a person. And maybe the parties change up. And when someone's with somebody else, maybe they're more resourceful and can live. But if you have somebody else in your party, maybe you have – maybe that person's a burden instead of a weight. And because that person decided to go with you rather than the other person, maybe someone dies because of that. I wish I wish the conversations might have made more impact because for me, they just – they felt like that they did not make, make an impact. It could have just been because of the playthrough that I did was – super conservative and maybe i chose conversation points that were just boring i hope that's not the case why, why would you make a game where, the, where you could choose an absolute boring playthrough um but i didn't feel like the conversation was ever something that i had to think about hard quick time events i thought about hard and whether or not to pick up a bat or you know use use a knife to pry my hands out of a of a bear trap you know like that could be that can make a difference. But even then, like you said, picking up that bat didn't save her life. And when Mike could pry his way out of the bear trap to save his fingers, he still couldn't die whatever he did. He's just either going to have um, no fingers and a good knife or broken knife and his fingers back. But what I was saying before, are we, sa- are we being a little bit too absolutist saying that if he could not die there, it doesn't matter? Right. The fact you that he said- is missing fingers and has a broken... Is you Mike said a different, death more shouldn't compelling be character? the only thing that matters. And yeah. I cared about Matt and Emily's relationship. That was that was cool. I cared about Ashley and Chris's relationship. And you can mess that all up too. You know? So that stuff did did matter. And to some extent, props to the props to the devs because they'd have to do a lot of writing to make all this possible. But I guess I was just wanting a little bit more. I really can't go too far into it. I guess I've I've probably beat th- this dead when to go to death. <laughs> this when to go to death. Yeah, I've beat this when to go to death, and I you know I really can't say much much more. I feel like the decision making was cool. I want games to have this as an option where your decisions do matter, but it was a good try, but it still fell a little bit short for me. So Tyler, the question was: Was anyone scared? Well, I guess Pete, were you scared at any point, or I've do you never not know fear? Scared. Yeah, yeah, I've never. <clears throat> Okay. Tyler, were you scared at any point? I was scared plenty. Um, I was pretty attached to most of the characters, and so the fact that um, I was aware that I could lose any of the characters because of a couple bad button prompts um, lent me (laughs) um, quite a bit of fear. So um, an interesting contrast I had, I, I don't normally interact with the horror genre whatsoever, right? I don't watch horror movies. I don't play horror games. I got through about seven minutes of amnesia before the sheer ambiance alone like drove me out of it. <laughs> but um, I found myself playing Until Dawn and Soma at about the same time. Now, granted, Soma is a much, much less scary game than Until Dawn, but um, I found it didn't bother me that much. I certainly had a great deal of apprehension, but I wasn't that scared whereas Until Dawn scared me a lot. And I think that's because of the kind of player that I am. I was, um, in Bartle-type terms, have you all heard about the Bartle-types before? No, why don't you explain? All right, so there's four Bartle-types. Um, Explorer, Killer... Oh, why don't you explain who, what the Bartle-type, like, what is... Yeah, who's Bartle? Do you know where that comes from? Oh, right. So he was a um, psychology researcher who was attempting to determine... Um, what exactly causes players to enjoy games? I'm sorry, no. I believe he's a game designer, actually. But um, they were surveying people about what they wanted out of a gaming experience, and they found that um, when they got all their surveys back, when they talked to people, people wanted just completely different things out of games, right? They were looking for completely different experiences. And so eventually he managed to classify them into four groups, Right, the four groups being explorer, who 
generally like to understand game systems and accumulate knowledge um, about the games. Achievers who enjoy having tangible um, representations like, read, like of Like rewards and stuff, yeah. Yeah. Um, killers who enjoy spiting other players and socializers who play games for the social aspect, um, be it communication within games or um, sometimes even communication with characters themselves, like as in the case of Until Dawn or Telltale Games. So um, people have done a lot with this um, in gaming literature, and so there's a few more subclassifications. And so the subclassification of the Bartle types that I... Um, identify most strongly with is Guardian, which is a mix of explorer and socializer that puts a great deal of value in um, accumulating resources and defending other characters, right? It, um, you can liken that into Myers-Briggs pretty easily, that it's a defender archetype that um, I tend to work with. So I, I guess I'd be a completionist if I'm the explorer achievement person yeah yes you're that visit 100 percent of the person. map that's it, collect 100 yeah. percent of collectibles that's what that is yeah that's pretty much spot on um so i tend to very strongly care about characters and i cared about all of until Dawn characters and was very um concerned with keeping them all alive so the constant threat of their deaths had me on edge all the time right so the jump scares got me because i wanted to be able to react to whatever quick time events would keep them alive um Whereas Soma is different, right? All, almost all of the horror is either um, from the concepts themselves, right? From the actual narrative, um, but it's kind of a like psychological horror where it's more um, concerned with giving you disturbing ideas. Whereas the actual horror mechanics of the game are entirely systemic, right? It's entirely or almost entirely avoiding big scary monsters. So. Um, when there was not another person in the situation that you had to worry about, you weren't as scared? Right. The The maximum consequence that I could be given in Soma <laughs> is essentially restarting from a checkpoint with a bad lens over my camera and, like, a bum leg. Like, that's that's pretty much it. That's all that can happen. So, whereas the, you know, the worst thing that can happen in Until Dawn is um, even in just a completely high-level... Um, game standpoint, you lose a pawn, right? You lose a character. You lose something which has value to you permanently in a way that you can never rectify. So that was huge um, with regards to my investment and immersion in the game, right? I was really concerned with keeping everyone alive, which made the stakes really high for me throughout the entire game and led to me enjoying it a lot and getting a lot of scares that I probably wouldn't have um, were I less invested in the characters or... Um, were it systemic enough that I felt like I understood it in such a way that I could um, actively prevent it. So yes. it worked really well for me. Yeah, I guess thinking of Bartle types, I'd probably fall into the same one as you, I would think, I would guess. I, I tend to be more about socializing and thinking about games and the systems and understanding than necessarily showing off how good I am, or I'm definitely not a killer, mm -hmm. I, I would hope. Um but the thing is, I saw a playthrough of this game before I played it. So while I did feel tension, especially when I got into the unknown, when I got into sections that I had not seen before, like with uh, Jessica and Matt actually being alive, um, I was super tense because I didn't know it was going to happen. However, I did see a playthrough, so I kind of knew what to expect from how to, how to survive. Um, like, hiding is a lot. Hiding is important in this game. Hiding is OP. Um... A lot of the time is the correct decision is not to run. The correct decision is not necessarily to fight. It's to hide. And that actually, I think it's cool that it funnels you into the mechanic that is the most difficult, the quick time event that is the most difficult, I think. The holding still, it kind of forces you into this tension where you have to obey. A, there's a physical tension and the tension of what's happening on the screen, and I think it mirrors pretty nicely. But once you know that hiding is nine times out of ten the right way to go, um, that kind of reduces the fear that someone's going to die unexpectedly. And it kind of puts the onus onto executing instead of onto um, understanding the situation. 
at a certain point, I wasn't like, am I going to re- make the right choice here? It was like, I'm making the right choice. Am I going to move my hands because my hands are sweaty? Or um, there was a point where it was the last sequence, and there are so many wait, you know, wait, don't move, wait, don't moves in the last sequence. And outside, I was playing over a friend's house, and outside of the room, like, there was an open, like, a glass door, and someone was walking around with a flashlight in the middle of the night, and it was as the last sequence was happening. And I'm like, is that the game, or is that actually a human being outside? I can't look, because I need to hold this in the zone, or else everyone's dead. Oh, God. And that was tension. That, that really impacted me, but it wasn't because the game was necessarily tricking me or anything. It wasn't making me super scared. It was just tense, because I felt the pressure to execute. Um... Pete, what did you think? Did you have, does any of this resonate with you? Yeah, well, I mean, part of that, well, one thing I wanted to say, maybe the scariest game I've ever played was the Fire Emblem games for oh, precisely man. this reason. Because when somebody <sighs> dies, they're gone forever, which is really a terrifying game mechanic when you think about it. But yeah, I mean, I think it combines with some of the discussion Billy was having earlier about sort of the horror movie <clears> trope, <throat> right? I don't necessarily have the same problem with them, but they do put that onus on execution in the way you were talking about, Gino. If you're familiar with the genre, you sort of understand the beats of it. You recognize when people are in danger, and it's no longer surprising, but the stakes are still high. You know, so it's compelling, it's interesting, but fright not, might not necessarily be the right term for it. Yeah, and there were definitely times where, like for example, when Ashley heard a voice, like I knew that that was not going to be a good thing to chase. Um, <laughs> They could have not told me anything about Wendigos, and I would have known that that's not a thing that I want to pursue. Um, so I, I thought it was very cool the way they arranged everything. But There's a tension with a lot of the stuff in this game, especially you know it being a horror movie and also being playable at the same time. And it's, I believe the game was actually directed by a director. It was. A, like a movie director, yeah. not a video game director. Mm-hmm. So there was... I guess on that note of sort of like film tropes and it being made in more of a film stance, I had a problem with this. This is more of a this is more of a marketing problem, I think. Um, I had an issue with the probably the first first four or five hours of of the game. Basically, before everyone splits up and gets in. Sorry, before I guess the first turning point is. When Jessica gets taken. Oh, when the game gets when to going. When the game... God <laughs> damn it. <clears throat> um, I have a problem with who they're marketing this game to. The second half of the game, this problem doesn't really exist because you've got a scary monster, you've got characters that, are, that, that care about more than their winter vacation, but... For the first like five or six hours of this game, what I get is character interactions that are soap opera at best and lines of dialogue like boom, butterfly effect. Or my tongue will get stuck to your flagpole. You know, like horrible lines, like terrible right and okay. Teen movie appropriate lines. Teen movie That's a right. great but now, line, by the way. Flagpole, who, that was spot on. I, I going chuckled. to the bone zone. Yeah, Come on. going right. So like Daily. Some, I use that phrase daily. Going to the bone zone? And it completely I was like, Oh, I'm gonna go eat that chicken over there. It was a boneless. No, I'm going to the bone zone. <laughs> Keeping it PG there. Um so what here's what I'm getting at. You have a game that's gonna have violence and excessive gore. Like there's some serious gory moments in this game. So you're definitely gonna get a mature rating. Yes. Like like either like 17 up, 18 up, like like Peggy 18 rating. You're definitely gonna get ratings that are gonna block out, assume that they're gonna block out teen, like young teen players. They're gonna get it anyway. Let's not go that route of the argument how they're going to get it regardless but the game's supposed to be filtered so that 16 17 18 and up play this game not younger kids right but the humor and the writing that they have for the first you know big chunk of the game if it was just like the first 10 minutes fine but it's like the first three four hours of this game are childish humor and kind of bad writing 
So I this wouldn't narrows say it's bad writing. I'd say they're writing teenagers like they're teenagers. Like they sound, or I guess they're supposed to be teenagers, right? Like college, yeah. almost college age. Like they'll say senior. Trip. They're eighteen. Right, but yeah. Gina, we talk about how the gamer is getting older now. Mm-hmm. Like the demographics that we have addressed and talked about in previous podcasts are like, hey, look, there's demographics. Um, like eighteen and under gamers are less than 18 and older gamers. There's more 18 and older gamers. I just think, so... So what I I'm think, saying is, who are you marketing to? You're making, you have like an, an, an adult game, but childish jokes. So there's like a very narrow margin of like 18 to 20 year old people that are going to actually find this entertaining. Um, my, so first thing is just on teen horror. Um, a lot of teen horror, especially like 80s, 90s stuff, even though it's rated R, it is very clearly marketed at actually teenagers who are getting into rated R movies. Like, um, there's, I don't know about you guys, I I went to a rated R movie when I was less than 18. Yeah. What? Gino. Yeah. And a lot of the times, some of the scares, quote unquote scares that they're going for, or like the titillation, like the fact that there's going to be, there was like 90 very close to a sex scene in this game um i think a lot of that hinges on the sort of maybe there's a boob and then there's going to be some violence and then there's going to be a few comedy moments maybe and that, a boob. Maybe is that a boob, boob. Yeah, yes yes <laughs> confusion over what can confirm not. was it a might boob. be a boob but i my understanding at least of the genre is that even though it's rated r their target audience is usually people you know 16 15 to 20 something and so I think that thinking that your audience or at least people would be familiar with the tropes of this genre in specific um, and playing into those is not necessarily – like it definitely doesn't subvert a lot of expectations other than what you as the player might do in your play style. Uh, the, the script does not go out of its way to like – you know, Emily's not going to be like this super deep character that completely changes what you think about the stuck-up girl in a teen horror movie. She's just an in, she's entertaining. Um, it's not like Matt turns the jock on its head, like he's the jock you're never gonna see coming. Or Mike, Mike is the the witty. Uh, I guess he's kind of he's not tough, like the witty, lovable loser who's gonna end up being the hero. No, Chris, like, that's Chris. Yeah, Mike's Mike, yeah. like the captain of the football team and like the class like president. The ladies, man. Yeah. yeah, but his jokes are so terrible. You're yeah, right. I don't know how it happened, but. <laughs> Right? The game expects us to believe it did. So it let has, me throw yeah. something out there. We take games. Okay, so you are trying to push back and say, look, this game doesn't have any delusions about what it is. It's a teen horror movie that you play with the PS4 controller. You know, so let it be that. And I say, okay, look, you're you're trying to make a okay, I'm saying you're trying to make a suspense horror game. A suspense horror experience, and they're trying. I mean, I feel like these guys were trying to be taken seriously. I feel like until John, until Dawn was in some ways making fun of the horror genre, and they do that stuff well. But in other ways, they were trying to be taken seriously. Games like Amnesia can be played by any age group, whether you're a don't, forty-year-old or an eighteen-year-old. Don't, don't let your kid play Amnesia. Right. Can't don't be let your kid by play Amnesia. Group. But. <laughs> That that re- that retains its scary for its same reasons, regardless of age group. Another game, probably not known so well, Slender, was a super basic game that was scary as shit, regardless of what age you are and what, I guess, like tier of, yeah, like and film film or game player you are. Same with something like a Silent Hill game. It stays it, it stays scary for its reasons, and I think. Until Dawn could have done stuff like that, but for some reason it chose not to. Why? Yeah, Tyler. Yeah, so I think the the two styles of horror that you're looking at are very different, right? Until Dawn's horror is entirely narrative based, right? It's all pre scripted, all fully rendered. Um, whereas um, Slender, Bioshock, um, Silent Hill are all you know systemic horror games, right? That they have the random components that we talked about earlier. That um, it's coming at it from a different angle, right? That Until Dawn is supposed to be a polished experience that you experience exactly one way. It's telling a linear narrative, and those games are supposed... The other games are supposed to um, have closer to replayable horror because of the stoichiastic components of their design. 
Um, but I think well, you have to explain what stochiastic means. It's random. I'm that. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think I think the way that uh, the game makes most sense is I've I've kind of tried to go back and think about how they um, designed the game, and I bet the angle that they were coming from was that they wanted to make a um, you know very cinemagraphic video game, right? A story driven game that resembles cinema and then they were trying to find the appropriate genre to slot that experience into i didn't i didn't get the feeling that um the inception for this idea was that they wanted to tell a teen horror story and this was the set of mechanics that would make it work best i got that they wanted to make a story driven um movie experience as a game and then the tropes of the teen horror genre just perfectly fit exactly what they could do I can see yeah. that a little bit, yeah. And I think that the goals of a Silent Hill and the goals of something like a Slender are pretty different from the, Until Dawn. Um, like Tyler said, moving through the game kind of in a very cinema, cinemagraphic, I guess you said, definitely aping um, movie techniques. But also, it, it's kind of almost thrill ride, and there's a lot of comfort food in Until Dawn, kind of... Seeing the familiar tropes and saying, ha ha, that's the trope. I understand that. I kind of understand where I am in this game and in this world. And I'm just going through this experience that I kind of know what's going to happen, but maybe there'll be some cool things in it. Whereas the Silent Hill games, like, they're there to kind of mess you up. Like, those games are really going to unsettle you. They are trying to unnerve you at every turn. Whereas Until Dawn is not actually committing to that, even though it, it has some uh, trappings that make you think it might. I think in Dr. Hill and some of the psychological elements that they start bringing in after the first chapter, um, it makes you think that maybe it's going to go in that direction, especially because um, there was a Silent Hill game. I believe it's Silent Hill Shattered Memories that used the exact same conceit of talking to a psychologist and giving them, ex uh, giving them your experiences and then having that shape the game. And so when you have one game that's actually trying to be horrifying, like Silent Hill, that's trying to unsettle you, that's trying to make you think about what is reality, what isn't, um, what has this character that you're controlling done, what does it mean to other people around you, versus this game, which is woo scary monsters, woo crazy psycho, woo haunted house, but really, other than a few jump scares, isn't trying to make you uncomfortable in your own home. Like... Silent Hill and Slender Man can make you uncomfortable in your own home if you play it the right way and really get into it. Yeah. Um, and so I think that those are two very different styles of horror. Um, one is definitely, you know, the Saw movies are not there to unsettle you psychologically. They're there to mostly make you go, ew, gross, or ew, needles in a toilet. But, like, something like The Babadook can make you not want to go to sleep. Um, or be very scared of, like, hanging suits, bowler hats. <laughs> okay. And it, it's also worth pointing out that it doesn't actually bill itself as a horror game, right? It's, it's trying to fly under the radar as a quote-unquote adventure title. But they, I think they know what the effect that they're going to have is, right? They're very conscious of that, and they're just playing it up, you know, having fun playing with their tropes, as opposed to trying to create that genuinely unsettling environment. Yeah. And so I think this would be a good time for a break. We're going to, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about those psychological effects we were just bringing up a little bit. And then the Wendigo Hunter is going to take us on an adventure into Wen Multi Wendigosity. I do have a cultural responsibility. Yes. I yeah. do have a couple more critiques that we'll throw out and we can handle those too. Yep. Okay. All right. We'll be back in a bit. Peace. And we're back. So, uh, I just thought that we've talked a lot about the story and the way that the game progresses, but we haven't really talked about some of the other mechanical trappings that are going on kind of in the menu. You've got a bunch of butterflies that show the butterfly effect that move forward, and you also have these menu bars and, like, these, like, D&D-style charisma bar, like, or like, stat, stat bars. like, emotional stat bars. Um, that didn't... I don't... I don't know what to make of those. Tyler, did you, did you see something there, or... 
No, I I think to the best of my knowledge, none of the bars, none of the relationship bars actually have any mechanical effect on the game other than occasionally um, cluing you into, like, if you threaten Ashley with the gun, she gets the lower Chris relationship, and so it rationalizes that. But other than fringe cases, which are already pretty well covered by the butterfly effect sections, there seems to be no point to it whatsoever, which makes me wonder more about the game's development than anything else. Like, um, they they went with the... Um, I cinematic, like a... I remember the actual word since the break. <laughs> they went with the cinematic angle all throughout, but it makes me wonder if there wasn't a greater systemic component where there were more... I wonder um, if there's actually like a numerical value attached to all of these like dialogue was like pick this option plus three sexy relationship with that hero. Like I was every single time that one of uh, Mike's stats went up, I was like, Mike, he's just romance incarnate. His romance, it's red. We can't, he can't be more romantic. This Wendigo is just going to want to have sex with him. It's not going to take his girlfriend. It's going to be like, can I get in there? <laughs> And it and it turns out to be uh, Hannah, so she would totally. Oh know, yeah, she's totally God. <laughs> yeah, but like I, I personally got something out of the bars, even if they didn't do anything, just because I enjoyed like, oh Chris, I guess I guess that makes you less courageous. What you just said right there, you should have <laughs> probably told the truth, or like Mike, yeah, you are romantic as shit. That was a that was a funny joke. <laughs> But um, it seemed like it was mostly, like you said, just to rationalize. Like, it made sense that if you say something to cross someone, you see the relationship meter goes da- go down, and then you know, oh, they're going to treat me like, like shit for the, rest, for the rest of the game, potentially. Yeah. I, I feel like it probably didn't need to be in there from a conveyance standpoint. Like, that's, that's a lot of um, what game designers end up worrying about, is not, not the actual mechanics themselves, but how players are thinking about the mechanics, right? And so the the butterflies probably did that job fine by themselves. It like it probably wasn't a problem of them under conveying. I wonder, um, they might just be in there to give um, immediate feedback on your reactions um, and your actions in the first like third of the game or so when it is almost purely dialogue, just to um, give the illusion of effects that later on that don't actually do anything. So but I'm if so, that's a nice cheap real trick. Real effects instead. Yeah. Yeah, that was I... actually early on when the dialogue was happening, I actually probably stopped caring about the bars halfway through the game once stuff started popping off because I realized that okay, oh crap, <clears throat> people might actually die now. Yeah. I really don't care if Emily's pissed at me anymore or if, you know, Mike is romantic as hell because he's got to kill some things. Or not get killed by some things. And I don't think that his relationship status, other than with this dog, is going to impact his survival anymore. Yeah, and this kind of leads perfectly into one of the remaining major critiques I have with this game, which is a dramatic shift in story about halfway through the game. It, it's almost a completely different story we're telling in the first half than the second half. So I played this game uh, once with... Um, a group of friends who were like trading controllers when there was a character switch or something like that and I got um, up to like the sanatorium or the or sorry a sane asylum place this was still pre-Wendigo I didn't see the Wendigo stuff when I played with my friends and then I played a little bit at another friend's house and he had some multiple like he had he had a completed save so I could play around with some of the chapters I also watched some Let's Play so I've seen a lot of different ways to play this game a lot of ways that things could have played out but there's a huge shift that happens and no matter who lives or dies up until this point you're going to get to this 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 plot point and you have to go through this plot point and a major shift turns so this is definitely spoiler status but we've already said when to go like too many times yeah Yeah, so up until this point, no, this is, yeah, well, this isn't really a Wendigo spoiler, but the whole first half of the game, there's like spooky stuff happening to the characters, like lights are going out, and Ouija boards, and people are seeing shadows, and... You mean spirit board, trademark. Sorry. (laughs) Whatever you want to call it. Spirit, fine. Ouija's gonna sue us. Like, books coming off shelves. All of it was faked by one of the characters, who was orchestrating this 
this insanely elaborate and really, yes, insanely elaborate <laughs> ruse okay. to trick the other characters. The reason being the previous year in the story, everyone's at the cabin again. Someone plays a prank on this guy's sister. His twin sister chases after her when she runs out of the cabin. Oops, they get killed. Oops, he's sad. Oops, a year later, he plots against them to trick everybody and scare them and say, how do you like it when you get scared? Oh, but you're not dead, but they are. So yeah. don't be tricky. And then, holy shit, the whole game changes because now when he reveals that he was this character, I'm like, wait, that was just like the big reveal of the game. What's what's left? Oh, I get seven more hours of a almost completely different story about how there's Wendigos now and I have to actually survive from a real monster. Yeah, you think you're playing a game, but it turns out you're playing a Wenda game. Man. <laughs> Signing off. I'm done, guys. Um, so, look, I have a problem with this. I have a problem with the term that comes to mind is like a bait and switch but i i don't i think i should give them more credit than that it's, they're not really deceiving me as a as the player i'm not really being deceived but it's just a lot of red herrings they they throw out the guy with the flamethrower he's clearly you you're set up to think he's a killer he's a psycho on the loose and he has a um, flamethrower well from the very beginning of the game and a, and you a see two things you see two things you see someone's point of view that's all like infrared right you see a person with flamethrower, but he's wearing, like, goggles. So it, it, it could be him in, like, goggle vision or something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's something going on. And I, and I had a feeling there was some kind of beast or monster part of the way through the game, especially when I replayed again before I actually saw winning. I was like, I was like wait, something doesn't add up here. Because there's no way Jessica could have had that happen to her by, like, oh, I'm playing a prank on you. I'm going to drag you through broken glass through... The forest. Ha 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 ha. Ha ha. Joke's on you. Like, that shit's not going to happen. And Josh even admits it. Like, wait, I never wanted to like, actually kill anybody. You know? So this is, this is, this is my problem. I'm playing through like seven, eight hours of this, of this game. And I think that there are certain rules to play by. And at this time, you're almost halfway through the game or more than halfway through, through, through the game. You should be able to trust your gameplay information at this point. Then there's a but dramatic shift where. Now you're worried about way different things. And the story is telling you way different stuff. So I don't like this hard left turn that it, that it goes to immediately. Like I wish that they would have maybe picked one and stuck with it or done a better transition from this to Wendigos or given us more Wendigo stuff from the beginning. And we kind of do, like if you get some early game collectibles, it can mention Native American tribal stuff. But like really, this is such a such a it's like a it's a it's a jump discontinuity if we're going to talk about some formal calculus it's it's discontinuous <laughs> yeah that that is true but i i feel like the the closest film analog is probably cabin in the woods right which without spoiling too much it spins about the first three quarters of its runtime um running through uh tropes in a very you know, structured way. It's specifically lampooning them and then makes a hard left turn and is about, you know, its own kind of horror situation that is at least somewhat unique to it. So I think what they probably ran into is there's not enough for them to do just lampooning the tropes themselves, right? There probably wasn't enough narrative room. <laughs> um, the, to get the experience that they wanted you to have, they had to add an quote-unquote actual horror piece to it near the end. And they do they do a good job of preparing you for it mechanically, right? They have plenty of those little don't-move um, sections littered throughout the game. The, the mechanics of the game stay consistent. It's just the tone that takes a really dramatic shift, which, I don't know. It's It did make it feel like a very different game, it, but... I think I still enjoyed it in a similar manner. Yeah, I guess. So my big thing was up until that point in the game when the Wendigo stuff starts popping off, um, you're kind of slowly assembling knowledge on what's happening. Um, you find stuff on the Native Americans. You find stuff on 
miners being trapped underground. And there's a mystique that's kind of getting brought up, especially Mike in the sanitarium. You find a lot of stuff about, oh, these miners came back and they were a lot more full than we thought they would be. Oh, something really weird's happening with like body, like some of the bodies were gone. That's weird. And you start piecing together, okay, there's something, something's wrong here. Like, why is this place, why, this is not how crazy people act in this account. It's like, these people started, this guy bit me. And it's like, okay, something's clearly up. And then once the Wendigo hunter, not Pete, but like in the game, the Wendigo hunter shows up, he has this long info dump that just goes from, there's a mystique about a monster to, you know, everything about the monster completely. Um, and it's like a, maybe like a five, six, seven minute sequence where he's just telling you about when to go, here's the situation on the mountain. Here's what's going on. Your friend's in danger. Everyone's, all you guys are fucked. Go <laughs> under the mountain, go under, go in the basement, lock the doors, hide your kids, hide your wife. This is terrible. That was and, the point that I hated the most. I was like, why is this happening? And I thought that the – it's not that I thought that the Wendigos being a big thing was a problem. I thought that subverting kind of the psychotrope and subverting um, that the flamethrower guy was just going to be a lunatic on the loose. Like they have a feud and a ghost story, a haunted house story also. They're juggling like three or four different uh, horror movie tropes as potential villains. I think they drop um, them all. Well, they don't drop them all. They say actually these – the psycho story, the um, the two different psycho stories, and the haunted house story are not actually um, the real threat. The real threat is the monster story. Um, and the way that they revealed the monsters I thought was inelegant because they didn't have to – I think they could have come up with a better way than an info dump. But um, I think that bringing the Wendigos out was – I enjoyed the Wendigos. <laughs> yeah. Having, a char- having your characters sit down and read a book for five minutes will rarely be the best way to convey an idea. Yeah. Like, they they have him speak for a while, then they have the reading of the journal, and by that point, it's kind of odd that then you get sent back to the sanatorium and find more clippings and stuff, because by that point, there's nothing more to tell you. Um, they gave you a journal that told you what the monster was, and he tells you where – you basically know at that point where the monsters came from, too – so there's not much to figure out. And even by then, Emily has found Beth's grave and Beth's head. So all of the mystery is gone, except maybe if you didn't figure out that Hannah is a Wendigo. But it's pretty hard once you know that Wendigos come from cannibalism and you found Beth's severed head but not Hannah. Even that kind of comes together pretty quickly. So I don't know. I, I see where you where you find complaint, Billy. So I would have liked it maybe if – there's a lot of ways that they could have gone with this story. They could have made Josh actually snap and become a killer. They could have made flamethrower guy from the beginning actually be, you know, I, I would have been cool with them having other tricks go on in the house. And then when the big, big Josh reveal happens, I say, wait, some of that stuff I didn't do. Wait, where's Jessica? Wait, what? There's another person doing this. And it was flamethrower guy the whole time. Like I would have been cool with, with 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 those twists, I would have been cool with Dr. Hill being a real person who actually comes out of nowhere and murders everybody. I, I, they could have gone so many ways, but I feel like introducing a monster of, and he's probably going to push back because I'm going to say like monster of nature when it's, oh, sure. I mean, it, it is a monster, but it's definitely a man, man monster. Okay, Pete, where you'll probably it's agree with me monster. is this. You know how they have these like, these like archetypes of stories like man versus man, man versus nature, man versus himself or whatever. Like there's these like types of stories that get talked about. I feel like it goes from one to the other in a hard way. And you shouldn't do that. Oh, you're seeing Wendigos as an embodiment of sort of the natural environment of the woods. So it ends up as a man versus nature story where we start with like a man versus himself with Josh a little bit, or maybe it's, maybe it's man versus society with like, Oh, there's, you know, a group of friends are going to tear each other apart. You know, yeah, this I, is... It, it jumps tracks too many times for me, to, for me to follow. That's my complaint. Well, this is where I'm going to push back on you, but I'm not going to challenge this track idea. I don't think the Wendigos are indicative of man versus nature. Right. I think okay. based on the Wendigo mythos, sort of the question of cannibalism, selfishness, you know, violation of social taboos, 
it ends on a pretty similar track as it started. It's a man versus the worst impulses in himself by the end. Seems like you know a little bit more about this Wendigo stuff, so... You are the Wendigo hunter. I am the Wendigo hunter. This is known. I mean, what, what did you think about the, in, the inclusion of this entire Wendigo theme? I mean, forget the part where we switch from man versus man to monster movie. I mean, why was Wendigo's chosen? Like, is this appropriate? Well, let's talk about it, right? In terms of environment, it's very appropriate, right? Because if we look at sort of the tradition of Wendigo, it was perpetuated by, and, you know, as much as I know, it was perpetuated by Native Americans living in a climate that led to you know, periodic starvation, right? They're living in the north, very cold. So that would then lead to famines, which, you know, think Donner Party, could inevitably lead to cannibalism, right? So there are these, in terms of like what they do with it, it is appropriate. My problem with it is the Wendigo is connected to long history, and especially currently, of challenges to Western imperialism, to sort of Western dominance, colonialism, Right, like part of part of the hypothesis of what led to the idea of the Wendigo was trauma associated with colonialism. You know, these colonizers, these fur traders move in, they take over Native American territory. And especially now, it's used as a criticism of Western culture, right? Sort of the the problems of capitalism, the inherent selfishness the Malaysia creates. Right. So my question is, you know, sort of setting aside these questions of environmental appropriateness. What about sort of this appropriation of culture, right? How does the game take something that's very sort of Western critical and sort of very associated with certain aspects of Native American culture and appropriate it as potentially just a movie monster? Well, I think one thing um, is they do try to go out of their way to imbue it with some of the Native, I guess, some of those themes that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. For example, Josh's family is a wealthy, they are wealthy filmmakers, horror filmmakers, um, and they buy this mountain uh, that was owned by a Native American tribe. Uh, I believe the mines were started before um, <clears throat> before Josh's family got there. The mines in the, uh, in the mountain were dug by uh, prospectors, basically, who came to the mountain and started digging. Yeah, it was like hundreds, like uh, over 100 years ago. Yeah, and then the on the mountain, on top of that, there was a hotel built on the mountain, again, not really run by the Native Americans, and a sanitarium built on the mountain, again, not for... And it's a sanitarium in the actual sense of a sanitarium, not an insane asylum. Sanitariums were actually places that you would go to to <coughs> seek uh, kind of... I'm going to use the word asylum, but it's not an insane asylum. You're seeking some sort of refuge from day-to-day -day life. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's just like a health spa. Yeah. It's closer to a health spa than an, a uh, some place where you send crazy people, quote unquote. Um, however, uh, well, I guess it's not even however. There, there's a lot of kind of capital explo capitalist exploitation of this mountain, mm -hmm. and the only spots where you see Native American influence is the totems you find that are strewn all across the mountain that show you premonitions of things that things that may pass. Um, you find a plaque that says this mountain was owned by the Native Americans, and here's what their totems mean. And then newspaper clippings, like some things about the Native Americans squabbling with. Uh, like either, developers or whatever. Yeah, either the Washingtons, Josh's family, or um, people with the mines and some of the curses, especially the Wendigo hunter that you find in the game saying that this is a Native American curse put on this land uh, because people violated the land. Um, and so they definitely dig into a little bit of this is a curse that is coming because of how this land and how this Native tribe were abused, and that brought about this Wendigo curse. But... It's definitely not an agent of the Native Americans, not necessarily. It's not like it's avenging for them or, or striking out. I, I guess it is because the people who took over are Westerners. Yeah, but, but even, I don't know, I think it's actually better if it's not an agent of the Native Americans because it suggests that this sort of selfishness, this sort of transition to going Wendigo is endemic to Western capitalism. You know, this sort of the exploitative practices we engage in necessarily lead to this becoming of Wendigo. It's not some sort of, you know, Native American, you know, perhaps even drifting into this noble savage type of communion with the land. 
Yeah, it's not it's not mysticism. It's not the uh, Tomb Raider, yeah. like, you know, uh, mumbo-jumbo, far east. It's not Orientalism, mm-hmm. which is what you were saying. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, because the way that the Wendigo curse eventually gets unleashed is people are <clears throat> digging mines that are not safe because yep. they want to dig into the mountain to exploit it, mm-hmm. and there's a cave-in, and people, rather than waiting for rescue and using emergency rations and then if they starve they starve some people started eating other people case of spelunky and explorers anyone ever hear that before no oh it's a totally aside it's like a big philosophy of law discussion about miners who were trapped in a cave-in and they were able to radio to the outer world and say hey what should we do and nobody had good advice so when no one gave them good advice. The the only way to survive was to eat one of the people, and they chose who to eat by lottery. The person that lost originally agreed, and then said, "Wait, I don't want to play anymore." <laughs> when he when he lost, and then they charged the people with like murder. Yeah. When this is all theoretical, it didn't actually happen. It was all theoretical law. I hope so. And <laughs> um. Yeah, but I, I found it funny as a person who studied philosophy pretty intensely that this case was basically mimicked in the story. You know, miners cave in. We have to cannibalize now. Oh, no, bad stuff happens well, when we survive. We actually don't because we either get sentenced to death or we become monsters. Well, do they need to? Because it, it seems like in some of the logs you find, they expected to find the miners emaciated. They didn't expect to find them dead. Um, they say in one of the logs that you can find, um, they expected to find the miners, you know, dying of, dying of starvation, not dead of starvation. So maybe they were not trapped so long under there that they would have died had they not resorted to cannibalism. But because they resorted to cannibalism, they never got to the point where they were pushed to their limit. Um, it, I think it's a little unclear on whether they needed to to survive, eat someone else. I think um, that's... <sighs> though Hannah, I think, does. And Hannah's situation is another one where people are just being mean to one another. It's just mean-spirited stuff <clears throat> that leads to her and her sister dead. Hannah's case, like you have her diary where it's like, it's been three weeks and I haven't eaten. I, there's, I'm going insane. I have to yeah. eat something. I'm sorry, sister. I'm going to have to feed on your corpse. Like, that's something that no one would want to do in any circumstance. And I actually looked up a little bit about Wendigos when I, um, and Pete might have, might have covered this a little bit, but there was, um, there was, um, like, I I guess it was told as a Native American folklore to prevent people from eating one another in term, in times of famine. That's one of the theories. Yeah. Like if, if, if you're going to. If you're if you're experiencing famine and you're at the point of starvation, suicide's the option, not cannibalism. They'd actually say you should kill yourself instead of eating somebody else. That's the better option. Make there be less mouths to feed instead of feeding on somebody else's mouth to feed. <laughs> yes, I. My first introduction to Wendigos was Final Fantasy VIII because there's a monster called the Wendigo, and funny enough, it plays basketball. Really. <laughs> with your characters. Not part of um, the legend. It, no, he uh, he'll beat you up real strong. He'll give you a bear hug and he'll like kind of hit you. And then one of Dunk. the moves is he picks up one of your characters and he squishes you down into a ball and then dribbles you, and that deals a bunch of damage. And then he has another one where he squishes you into a ball and then he kind of dribbles you and then dunks you towards the oppo- towards the rest of your party. And then that character bounces around and hits your other party members a few times before be- becoming a Final human. Final Fantasy again. Eight, you're such a good game. We're probably gonna hear something about it soon. Probably, if someone edits. Yeah. So if we ask sort of, you know, like we'd like to do, if we extrapolate from this Wendigo <laughs> problem a little further, right, from the things we've been talking about, from some of the connections we've been drawing, I'd say it does, you know, not a perfect job, right? There are a lot of, a lot of problems with it, but a better job at least than Final Fantasy in sort of using cultural touchstones appropriately, right, with some sort of yes. respect for how they operate for where they come from. Yeah, so I think, Final Fantasy does not care yeah. where it comes <laughs> from. No, Shiva's Shiva's a nice goddess now. Quetzalcoatl's a giant thunderbird. <laughs> Ifrit, so I think, fire god. I think the question we can ask is how much cultural appropriation we can accept from video games, right? And I think part of this, if I can, you know, 
toot academia's horn for a second. Please do. I think part of this is that there's a lack of scholarship around video games. If you ask sort of who asks the questions about, like, who points out that Heart of Darkness is a pretty racist book, right? Academics. And I don't think we have that sort of apparatus for video games, and so they get away with a lot more of this stuff that wouldn't be acceptable in other mediums. I'm hoping that video games get there. So yeah, I think that that's coming in now. Um, there's a lot more critical writing coming in, especially in the last five to ten years. Um, a lot. The problem is it's really outside of like first you need to convince a um, some sort of college to hire you as a professor of video game literature, yeah, that's a good which point. to my knowledge is a position that only really exists at maybe a few dedicated game schools. Yeah, pretty much impossible, um, probably. Pretty much impossible. Pretty right much now. impossible, probably. I, I mean, I haven't seen that outside of a few handful of, of people that I've seen speaking at gaming events. So um, then if you're not going to be a literate, like an actual um, tenured professor, you have to, I guess, get paid as a journalist or as a critic with a Patreon account or something. But as a journalist, <clears throat> there's not really a lot of money in writing long form analyses of games, well, one of those even though that's what we do here. Journalism that don't get paid. Yeah, and then if you don't get paid, that means you're not eating. Yeah. It means you're probably not. It you means should probably you're have a side job. To go if you start eating people. That's true. Um, there's a commentator on YouTube named Mr. Beaton. Um, have you all watched any of his videos in the past? Oh, well, he has a lot of great insights, and he has a, um episode about this issue exactly. And so his conclusion is because the – infrastructures in traditional academia just completely aren't there for video games and won't be for a very long time until they've become such a part of the cultural mainstream for so many years that they can begin to be studied and analyzed that essentially the internet has to um, serve as the, the classroom. Um, yeah, the classroom. And the audience. The, yeah, the um, stage for the debate pastors. about video games. <laughs> Teacher and student. Um, yeah, <laughs> what it really is. And um, so, in fact, we're contributing to it now in our own little way. But Oh, um, God. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Don't listen to this. Um, but no, that, that's probably true. And it will be so long before video games can support that kind of academic um, discussion and, and that place within academia. So... Yeah, it's it's a problem that will just be solved with time, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're still of an age where film critic or film professors had to justify their positions and sure. remember having to justify their positions. Yeah. So, I think video games have a little bit of ways to go, considering <clears throat> motion pictures were around in, I believe, the advent was in the nineteen twenties or thirties. I mean, even genre fiction. You know, Western scholars, detective story scholars, they still have to justify their studies and how they've been around you know, since Yeah, globalization books. professors, yeah. professors, like some it's subcategories of established uh, mediums still. True. You have a hard time. Not to mention the ongoing struggle for just becoming a professor in general of literature in the modern environment, <sighs> which isn't a great conversation. Hey, Pete, sorry. It's just heartbreaking. The, you chose the this. Struggles. I did. I did choose this line. Yeah, so speaking of being the people who call out when games kind of go astray and maybe do some things that are a little despicable, um, the way mental illness is handled in this game made me a little bit upset, I suppose, especially considering we played To the Moon, yeah. and that game handled mental illness incredibly well. We played even Psychonauts. Psychonauts. Psychonauts did a pretty yeah, well Psychonauts showed respect yeah. to, to mental illness in some spots. This game does not... Um, so first, I just want to discuss Dr. Hill, those sequences. Okay. Um, like I said earlier, uh, that's kind of Silent, Silent Hill Shattered Memories, I believe, is a game that used the exact same conceit. You are talking to a psychiatrist. They are taking notes on you, and how you answer certain questions will change the way the game appears. In that game, your first interview could be like, do you prefer men or women? Um, if you prefer women... What do you prefer about them? And if you say something sexual, like there are characters that will, sh there's a character who shows up who's a woman. And if you uh, 
say that you like attractive women more, like her hair color will change, like the buttons on her dress will get on her uniform will get unbuttoned <laughs> depending on how you answer the questions or rebuttoned or she'll be, have different hair color. And a lot of the game changes based on the questions that based on the way you answer. Even the monsters change depending on what scares you most or what your particular hang-ups are. Um, this game does that exact same thing. Um, so how did you guys answer, I guess the first major battery was, um, questions just kind of showing you two, um, scary things and you could pick one or the other. Um, what did you guys end up as your like key fears? Uh, his room will change to reflect what your key fears are. I um, shouldn't go first. So for example, <laughs> mine, mine were a snake in a jar who hissed at me the whole time. A needle, some gore, like a animal on pins, and then hanging on a meat hook was a scarecrow. And those were, I guess, what the game keyed in on and said, okay, these are the things you're really scared of. So we're going to fill this room full of those things. Um, what did you guys see? So, Tyler? Yeah, I had needles, a beating heart, and a mannequin that was, like, moving around. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, but I know it actually affects the, um, game in a small manner. Like I noticed yeah. in, um, my playthrough, I had needles and in my friend's playthrough, um, the, the psycho has like a gas mask that he uses to incapacitate people instead oh, yeah. of a needle, which frankly just seems oh. less efficient. But, um, <laughs> so that was neat. Although what it's actually saying about the game in the context of the, reveal is that Josh is specifically attempting to incapacitate people with his own fears, which is a weird conceit when you think about it that way, but it works in a, <laughs> in the game's context. Yeah. And I think that that conflation. So early on when you were seeing those sequences uh, with Dr. Hill, who did you think was in the chair? Do you, cause I thought it was me. I thought yeah. it was supposed to be a player analog. They're talking about you're playing this game with these people and their lives. Who are you to do this? Why would you play this game? And over time, I'm like, okay, so this is – it's breaking the fourth wall. This is uh, postmodern analysis. He, here are the tropes. Why are you doing this? Yeah. It's questioning the entire lineage of horror. Um, and then eventually they reveal it's kind of – it's Josh. Um, but – then there's the second battery of questions, which is, which of these characters do you like the least? I guess first, Billy, what were your things? All right, so I played the game wrong, I guess. Because, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm going to say that you can't play a game wrong. It's a game's fault if you can play a game wrong, right? Um, oh, okay. Yeah, okay, hey, 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 game designer wannabes, like, hey, what's up? <laughs> I'm going to say it's a game's fault if you can actually, like, mess up playing a game. Right? Okay, you so how did you... So I didn't mess up, but what I'm but what I'm about to say is going to, I guess, shed some light on the point. <clears throat> I oh, just boy. I just knew that this game was asking me what I was afraid of so it could scare me. So I just picked the things that I, that I was not afraid of. So you did not suspend your disbelief. You <sighs> just... I just you... said, well, I'm mean, all right. You opted out. I just, I mean, I had the option to. Because somebody, That's, you know, so the only thing. But he berates you. He says, it's better if you answer accurately. Fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, yeah, yeah do whatever no. I want. It's, you don't tell it, Peter Stormara not to tell you scary things in a weird way? Yeah, well, anyway. That's not, um, that's not playing the game wrong. That's just refusing to play it. So, I... I keep picking up these cards in Candyland. They're telling me to go to certain colors. Nah, Fuck that's not what I'm about. I'm going to go visit the, the Peppermint Forest. Um, okay, go ahead, Bill. So, yeah, I saw that as a pretty cheap way to develop scares. So I said, F that, I'm not going to do it. And I picked things that weren't scary to me. This was on the... And then you not the play. By those things it wasn't scary. on the playthrough that I did with my friends. Because I think somebody else was primarily picking um, well, uh, those things. Somebody else was playing at that time, so it was primarily their fears. We had a little bit of input, but um, it was primarily their fears, not mine. So I was already kind of dis, like, disconnected. And then 
on the let's play that I saw, they picked almost all of my fears. So I got a little bit of that too. And then when I replayed again, I said, Hey, I'm just going to mess around and see what happens. So yeah, I directly picked the things that I wasn't afraid of. And I don't feel like I, I don't feel like I gained anything, which is pretty obvious to say. Right. But I don't feel like I lost anything either because only thing that I lost were like the cheapest of jump scares in the game. Like there's one time you're walking through a forest and um, this is one of the kids' pranks. Like something pops up at you and it's, and it's either a clown or a zombie. That's it. That or makes a scarecrow. No or a scarecrow. That makes no difference. Who? I don't like scarecrows. So when I saw it, I was like, ah, scarecrow. I don't like Fine. Clowns. Like that is the cheapest scary thing to me. I so I think the velocity with which it appears on the screen like merits a jump scare regardless, right? It doesn't. Yeah, that's I didn't saying. have to have a register. It was, it was going to be a jump scare. Hmm? It could have been a bunny rabbit, and it would have been a jump scare. Yeah, <laughs> not like a Donnie Darko bunny rabbit. Would have been a literal that, that jump shit scare. actually scary. A Donnie Darko rabbit is actually scary. Yeah, that's yeah. the worst. And then the second one, when you're picking which of these characters you like the least, um, I ended up with Josh as the character who I like the least, Man, he sucks. which changed the way I played. Pretty, which changed some stuff because as soon as you say it's Josh. Um, Dr. Hill's like, this This explains a lot. Because who do you hate the most? Yourself. <laughs> and so um, that that actually changed some of the context later on um, of things he would say to me. He's like, you've already admitted you hate yourself the most. Why put others through this? But did you guys actually pick a different character? Or? I think I picked Emily. Figures. I think I picked, what was it, Mike? Mike's the most romantic guy? Yeah, I think I picked my. I was just jealous. <laughs> yeah, you just don't have his bone zone game, you know. It's it's, <laughs> it's terrible, man. Wish I did. Oh, they're they're back and forth about the presidential, the presidential sex talk is just great. Stump speech. I was, I was gonna give you my stump speech. Yeah, I don't know. I'll show you the Lincoln bedroom. <laughs> oh, you're gonna get presidential on me. Just wicked right. games, but. Just so much good game. Um, but what did you guys think of kind of that breaking of the uh, the fourth wall? At least it appears at first as though the game is making a commentary on playing a game where you're putting these people in jeopardy. Why you would do that? What do you have to gain from doing something like that? I thought it broke you the momentum. It? I didn't like it. I feel like I would have rather have skipped those scenes and just – had more gameplay because I feel like that was just a hard momentum break. And if they, I mean, I, can I ask, did they actually release this game in chapters? No, no, no. So it wasn't an actual like no uh, telltale a, game where you get like chapters, right? It was not episodic, right? No. Then why were there previously on Until Dawn? Like, why did you do those? Those were annoying as shit too. Like, why? I know what happened five minutes ago. I was there. It's convent. They're trying to no. ape the style of like a series. That and Billy has no patience for that. That and the Doctor Hill scenes were just momentum killers for me. They're also giving you an opportunity if you were going to take breaks to have nice natural break points. You can also just press pause. Like, but you know, there's a Tyler. Yeah. Do you want to explain like gameplay settings and stuff like that and? Yeah, Eth like, ethical game design is a thing. Giving your player natural stop points to propel them to take breaks and to get along with their lives um, in a manner as to get loopholes, prevent addiction, all that stuff is like ethical game design 101. But the, so basically me, not Dark Souls. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, Dark no, Souls Dark is not Souls death is a very natural break point and is common enough for most players to... <laughs> serve that purpose pretty well you know uh destiny finishing a game of hearthstone no, yeah destiny doesn't like, destiny has no ethical game design it is just there to steal your life away the end of strike Dota. missions is a pretty good thing there's matches you know it's it's not the worst from that standpoint okay um, we understand what you mean so, when you say ethical game making i get it yeah um but for me the the dr hill sequences i feel like they kind of set up a um they wrote a check that the rest of the game didn't really cash, right? Yes. That, um, so when they take you out in those sections, 
you're basically telling the player, all right, we're going to just be super meta, all right? We're going to be super meta. We're going to do all this cool stuff. We're going to ask you questions. We're going to affect your decisions. And then ultimately after the reveal, that kind of fell apart. You know, it it did give some stop insight. mattering. Hmm? It stopped. It stopped mattering. Yeah, exactly. Hard um, left turn. Thanks, Wendigos. <laughs> Why don't you, Wendigo, fuck yourself? Hey! hey. I, everyone's got puns. Yeah. The, it may be that the Dr. Hill sequences and the Wendigos didn't really belong in the same game. Um, the, they abandoning a lot of the meta narrative to be Wendigos makes the Dr. Hill sections a lot less meaningful. But, um, you know, doing the whole postmodern thing, doing uh, breaking the fourth wall like that did um, indicate to me exactly how self-conscious the game was and that it was going to be setting up those tr tropes to be knocked down. So in that way, I think they helped what the game was trying to do, right? It, it got me into that mindset of we're playing with tropes, we're playing with genre. It helped like the first six hours immensely barring my complaint about momentum breaking yeah pete do you have anything about the, like the postmodern element of it yeah that's i guess the question would be like how much leeway do you give the postmodern like how many <laughs> how many posts can you append to the front of that thing like all right, maybe they weren't postmodern but maybe they were post postmodern you know like they set up a conceit. Oh, this is going to be metafictional. No, it isn't. Oh, that's so post postmodern. <laughs> I guess it just depends how much leeway you want to give them. I agree with most of the stuff we've said. Like, it seems like they were setting something up that ultimately they didn't follow through on. But I think maybe there's an argument to be made for the intentionality of that. You know, it's still annoying, but it's <laughs> intentional. You know? Yeah, it, there was definitely a lot of intent, and I guess. Yeah, post postmodern. Yeah. They're setting up a postmodern twist. It's gonna be like a complete spin on. Oh no, actually, it's just it's another horror movie. It's a twist on the twist, which brought it back to the beginning. Like exactly where it was in the beginning. Oh god. Yeah right. And then the part is where when they strip away the conceit, it just reveals that Josh is insane. Yeah. Is the central conceit. The conceit is that he has a mental illness, and because he's mentally ill, he is dangerous. He is unpredictable, and he has caused this harm to all of his friends. And he is the only character who cannot be saved. Um, you can say that he can be alive, but the best case scenario for Josh... Actually, I don't know what best case is in this. Is it being dead, or is it being a Wendigo? Which is better? Can he be dead? Yes, he can be dead. Um, if you if you don't find his, uh, his sister's gravestone, I believe... Um, he won't recognize Hannah, and then Hannah just kills him. Oh, right, but right, right. if he recognizes Hannah, he becomes a Wendigo. Also, he can, he can, I think there's a weird way he can die where he can be in his mental trip-out state, and, like, a hallucination of a monster can kill him. Really? I think. I might be, I might be... I might be wrong on that, but I know that I... All right, I watched a couple of videos. I watched every single death possibility in a YouTube video, and that's one of them. One of his death possibilities is, like, right when he falls down the pit or whatever, and before, what is it, Mike and Chris? Sam Mike and him. Sam find him in the mines. He's in, like, a little corner of the cave just talking to himself, but from his perspective, like, there's monsters talking to him. Yeah, and one of them can kill him, and I don't know if that's supposed to represent like his mentality just shattering and him just absolutely losing it, or if he actually dies, dies. I don't know. I'm not sure. But I think that's one of his I, death options. I want to go fact check that. You can you can continue, but I'm 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 gonna fact check that right now. Yeah, and it, yeah. it may be worth pointing out that the reason that he gets captured is because his friends kind of freak out over him and his actions, right? And lock him up in a, you know, icy barn away from everyone else. Like, it's mm -hmm. them so thoroughly rejecting him and then leaving no one to guard him <laughs> that ultimately leads to him dying or worse. Yeah, and the thing is, his mental breakdown scene was what really got me. Um, when he is 
starting to talk in different voices and he starts humping the air and he starts saying things that up until that point is completely he's relatively composed like you know bone zone comment notwithstanding um he's saying things that are pretty normal there's no reason to suspect like if he has a mental illness he has it under control it would seem but then when it goes on to say he's the psycho all of a sudden he's acting not just crazy but like comically crazy like in such a way that justifies him being treated incredibly poorly by everyone else. He doesn't apologize when the game is up. He starts buying into, like, he didn't do anything to Jessica. But instead of being empathetic and starting to really try to help the situation and make amends with his friends, he just goes off into, like, this weird haze that's set up to make you distrust him. Um, Instead of making you know mental is to be depicted in a way that's something hopefully realistic or a little bit more sympathetic um i feel like it's used as a crutch to make you dislike him so that when he gets snatched you're kind of really questioning whether you should save him mm. and and it really it wasn't I, I just didn't like that that was the twist it's not that he is vengeful it's not that he is wrathful and that's why he's doing this to his friend it's they also have to throw on, and he's mentally ill, and he's off his medication, and that's why he's doing all of this. When I feel like you could have just said, hey, these people killed his sister, basically, or he believes they did and blames them for it, and that would have been enough of a justification without having to throw mental illness on top of it. Yeah, I mean, everybody loves the, sort of the Count of Monte Cristo narrative, right? Person's wrong. He spends a year planning this elaborate revenge. Like, that More would have than been a another- year, I think, right? In Count of Monte Cristo or in yeah. the game? Count of Monte Cristo, it's forever. It's like Yeah, basically a game. lifetime. Yeah, the game, it's only... Is it one year? It's one exactly. year. Yeah, one year, the exactly. Game, it's one year. So, yeah, they easily could have done that, right? But, I mean, I think it may even becomes more problematic that it's not essentially, because I, I, I believe he had some sort of, you know, mental issues earlier than that, but it's essentially a trauma-based illness, right? Like, it's seeing his sisters killed that sort of pushes him over the edge here, isn't it? No, you can actually find a medical... So if Sam does not get captured by Josh, right. she can wander around his, like, psycho lair, and in there you find a cell phone with texts from Dr. Hill saying, you should see me, your plan... I guess he talked with Dr. Yeah. Hill about his plan to play this game, and Dr. Hill said, this is not going to get you the closure you need, I think it's just going to be worse for you. And you can find his medical records. Okay. And in his medical records, it says he's been seeing a doctor for X amount of years. And at a certain point, he some of his medication stopped working and he had to be put on a new medication. And then the last part of the transcript is like, he's off his medication. Okay. Um, after his sisters, he goes back in, gets treatment. But, you know, the last log is maybe he's off his medication. What's going on? Gotcha. Um okay. And that's kind of used as a way to explain his erratic behavior. And uh, I don't know. It Just the scene where he's, like, humping the air and doing all that stuff, it really didn't sit well with me. And, like, he's starting to talk in funny voices. Like, he, it becomes almost comic relief how insane he is. Like when uh, he gets stabbed by Ashley in the, in the arm. I think he says something. Like, like lesson stabbing. learned. Lesson learned, and then he punches her in the face. Well, also, he and goes into a, what is it, a like a John Wayne impression when yes. he loses it, and then it makes his earlier John Wayne reference now different. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe it retroactively makes some of his earlier lines called into question where otherwise they wouldn't have been. Yeah, and then there's the insanity effect at the end with the pig and the, the sisters coming back and him freaking out, and then the only answer is to hit him to get him to snap out of it that I feel like that's also not a great answer. You know, someone's having a psych psychological breakdown and punch him in the face. snap out of it, punch him in the face. Yeah. it, And you can't help him. Never do the other characters find a way to help him deal with the trauma. The answer is to leave him behind um, and basically cut him out. And I feel like that's, and really, they're endangering their own lives by going after him. Like, trying to save him almost gets everyone killed. I mean, again, there's... I think you're absolutely right about everything. 
Well, not everything, Gino. You're absolutely right about this. Um, again, there's a way to sort of do that sort of post-post trick with this, too. Like, obviously, given the way the majority of, you know, the country, the legal system, the ha mental health system treats, or I shouldn't say the mental health system, but the way, you know, certain subsets of our society treat mental illness, of course there's no way to help them. Like, of course there's only an abandonment. But I think at this point, you know, whatever we say about the Dr. Hill thing, that's giving the game, I think in this case, far too much credit. Yeah, and I guess they also double down on it with the sanitarium being this scene of horror, and it's another example of people. Like, sanitariums were not insane asylums, but they make it look like one, and they make it behave like one. And I don't know why a sanitarium would have a morgue, but it does. Um, especially if it's the sanitarium next to a hotel, like, but they, I guess they need, they wanted to play up the abandoned insane asylum aspect. And so they added things that would have been out of place or I think would be out of place. I, Hey, if what I know about sanitariums is wrong, feel free to correct me. But yeah, I, and maybe if we didn't play to the moon or psychonauts just this year, and saw a better way to handle this, I wouldn't be as critical. And it's not like horror movies have a great track record of dealing with mental illness. Like, that is a crutch that has been leaned upon. You know, Jason is a mentally ill person whose mother abused him, and so he's taking it out on the campers. Like, a lot of stuff, with, or is, I forget. One of them, it's Jason's mom. One of them, it's Jason. First one's killer, Jason's I mom. I mean, then it's... I mean, this is extrapolating pretty far past the game, but there's a lot of sort of pro like tropes of mental illness that are just completely erroneous and really reprehensible. Like if you think of, you know, the most famous book about mental illness ever written, right? Probably One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And what's the message mm -hmm. of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Oh, these people don't need their medication. They don't need help. They just need, you know, some rough go-getter to come in and, you know, take them on a fishing trip. That's a horrible message to present about mental illness, right? So it's really, it's, it's systemic. You don't need to stop shock. Yeah, stop shocking them. Probably, that's probably fine. That's like a yeah. decent message or, you know, in certain circumstances. But yeah, them just kind of getting over it by having normal human interactions yeah. is not necessarily an accurate depiction. And the book, the book does a better job of this, but the movie especially sends that, that message pretty much on the face of it. Yeah, that movie. Even though Jack Nicholson, he's crushing it. Yeah, he he's crushing it. But yeah. So, does anyone else have any other stuff to say on this topic? Or yeah, I mean, it's, it just makes me sad. The game's so fun. Right. It's so lighthearted. Well, <clears throat> you know, lighthearted in a hard but movie sense. You got monked, son. <laughs> By the way, I. Uh... I just finished fact checking that Josh death. I think Thank God. I, I can't I can't Pins find the exact them. scene that I saw, but what I think happens is he can fail a quick time event and it looks like he dies and then they just find him and he's mumbling to himself again, broken insanity, you know, or broken sanity. Okay. Whatever. Okay. So he gets eaten by pig face, but then <laughs> Just it right at the very the end of that situation. sequence, like a giant Wendigo comes out, and I think you have to like pass a QTE or something, or like a whole cell yeah. or something. And if you fail, it like rips his face off. But okay, th I think it actually doesn't end up in him dying, but he just is still rambling to himself insanely. So, anyway, okay. I have like maybe like two quick things that I wanted to say again vent your spleen. What? Vent it. All right, so it's a saying. more stuff that I had wrong with the game. Um, and I, I mean, you guys got to give it to me at least because I'm usually like the ultimate defender of games that need to be critiqued. Like, how Defended long did I fight for Kingdom Hearts? Oh my God, forever. How yeah, long did I fight for Kingdom Hearts? The thing is, like, I don't say this thing is definitively wrong. I, I usually say this is the thing that made me think about the game or this is the thing that I think could have been improved. Maybe you should be more definitive, Gino. Anyway, I, I my think... critiques are, um, so I want to talk about uh, 
a little bit of gameplay stuff, a little bit of collectible stuff, a little bit of camera stuff. So I did not like the hold still QTEs. I thought they took away. We kind of mentioned this earlier. The hold still QTEs, I think, were kind of, hey, look, we have motion controls. Hold still. You know, I'm, I'm actually the kind of person that will sometimes sit in, like, really uncomfortable positions, like with my foot on the desk or whatever, or maybe, like, I'm Yeah, you're screwed up a, if, if you got like, one of those QTEs. That's just something that's irrelevant outside of the game. Possibly killing one of your characters, and for a player like Tyler, that's a bad experience. I'm a I'm like that too. I want to save people, but I want to be able to sit upside down in my beanbag chair and and, and do it. You know, if you know if I'm like if I'm like a knee bouncer. This is a eight, serious I, game. I mean, like for example, some some people are the kind of people no that like chairs. tap their leg or like they're like knee bouncers, right? Yeah, I do that. And I do that. It was if very you're holding your fun. your controller there, like knee bouncing. You have to prevent your own, like you have to do something contrary to you as a human, like to, in order to win the game. That that doesn't sit right with me. Knee bouncing yeah. is fundamental to your core as an individual. No, I'm yes. I'm not a knee bouncer, but somebody who is. I was just giving it as an example. Yeah, the thing is, it's it's something that when I'm comfortable, I might do, and to know that me being comfortable and actually immersed in the experience might just get a character killed. Incidentally, I don't like. It's kind of a bummer, especially when those events get sprung on you out of nowhere. Like that, that just sucks. If you're opting into hiding, like that's cool. But actually, I think every single one of those do you? No, you don't. uh, You don't opt in. Like some stuff can jump out at you, and you have to say you. You have to be still. Isn't that the point, though? I mean, that sounds like a a selling point to me. That like bouncing your knee gets you. If you were hiding from a Wendigo, Gino, and you bounced your knee. Might get you killed. There's it's a true. difference between being a being a person outside the game in your comfort zone as a player and enjoying your game experience, and the act of enjoying your game experience makes you have a worse game experience. Don't you see the contradiction there? Well, yeah, because you said it that way. <laughs> You're right. I said it <laughs> yeah. that way. Well, so to me, I felt like um, ultimately, as a mechanic, it was effective for me because that was. Um, Perhaps when I was most, yeah. Well, it was, it was tense as a mechanic. My uh, controller's, you know, getting up there in the years a little bit. So <laughs> it's slightly miscalibrated. So it would just ever so slightly drift to one side, even if I just had it like sitting on a table. So I had to <laughs> counteract it, which was a very tense experience. But that I would be like, tense if your controller was just broken. Yeah, of course that'd be yeah. tense. <laughs> um, but I feel like it helped my immersion more than it hurt it. Um, you know, I, I didn't have the knee bouncing problem. I could see where that would be um, an issue. But ultimately, it, it put me in the shoes of my player or of my character really well. So one of my favorite sequences from Heavy Rain is when you're trying to um, slip through these, like, power converter wires. And so what they have you yeah. do is contort your hands into all these weird shapes, like press, like... Uh, square and triangle and then like an R2 button and like move a joystick, all this weird stuff at the same time so that you as a player are getting the same experience of contorting yourself into a weird shape as the character is on screen. And so having to like teach the player those prompts and everything breaks your immersion a little bit at first, right? Because you're aware it's a game again. But once you kind of get used to it, I feel like... um, it's not mechanics as metaphor, but it is a effective way to create a kind of immersion and a kind of feeling in the player that I feel like it did a good job of doing. Yeah, and there's a button mashing sequence in Metal Gear Solid 4 that's very famous where you have to mash a button through a very dangerous obstacle, and it's supposed to mimic the pain that the character is going through, trudging through this. But So you're, you're hammering for like two minutes. It's, it's a really oh, uncomfortable <laughs> amount of time. That's easy for me, though, like button mashing is right <laughs> off um, What was I your next complaint? So I had a problem with camera angles. It also took my immersion away a, a, a okay. little bit. I want to be able to explore a world fully. That's how I get immersed. I am one of the bottle type explorer or whatever they're called. And a game that I love and a series that I love, like Devil May Cry is a to me, I, I can't think of a more positive gameplay experience. I love Devil May Cry so much. And Devil May Cry 1, awesome. Biggest drawback is camera angles. It just actively hurts gameplay a little bit. Here, 
we all have games like Devil May Cry to look back to, games like Resident Evil, like one or two or something that had also bad camera angles. Games like, it, um, what else? So it had scripted camera angles. Right, right, right. right. You it, could like you don't have direct. Yeah, camera you could control. like R two like change the camera angles, but it'd be like disorienting and confusing sometimes. Like that just took away from the gameplay experience for those kinds of games. I think. If the characters so you had, just don't like static camera angles. Yeah, well, yeah, I just don't like static camera angles, but it works in okay. some games. Like, in a game where you're on, like, more rails than this, it works. For example, you're on static camera angles for lots of, like, Final Fantasy VIII, right? When you're going through towns, aren't you on static camera yeah, they're, angles? Yeah, they're pre-rendered. Yeah, they're, like, they're pre-rendered, pre-rendered towns. Scenes. Yeah, but the those uh, are basically flat uh, yeah, they're flat worlds, but I'm thinking about okay. I'm thinking about like God of War. There isn't another angle to see. Right, I'm thinking about games. like a like a God of War game. You walk into a room, but it's actually not a room. Yeah. It's a cliffside, and all you get is the angle of the cliffside. You walk through the cliff, yeah. you slash all the bad guys, and then you get around the corner, and the camera angle just in one frame changes to the next side of the cliff. Like that's yeah. one kind of fixed camera angle. This was a different kind of fixed camera angle than that. Or I shouldn't so it say it was a different a... camera angle. I'm saying the world was supposed to feel different than that. Yeah. So, is your issue that it was in so tight and it was almost claustrophobic? Not claustrophobic, because sometimes you had a whole room of camera angle to work with. Like early in the game, when you are Chris and you jump through the window and you got to go find the lighter or something, like you're, you're you're pretty open world there. Or sorry, not open world. You're pretty. You have a lot of of room between the camera and the character. It's not up on you. It is in some mm-hmm. parts of the games, but it's not that close to you. Like in parts of Tomb Raider, which we just reviewed or just did a podcast on, there are those scenes where she's like in a like a flooded tunnel and the camera's way up on her because she's like trying to keep her head above water and it's supposed to feel kind of claustrophobic because she's supposed to feel kind of claustrophobic. That's that's fine. And so, what's your complaint? My complaint um, is this game is supposed to be one where I can explore a cabin or explore a forest and get spooked out by stuff or get spooked out by my surroundings, and I couldn't because I, d- I didn't have control to explore. I'm, I'm not expecting to explore a God of War game where I'm running through a hallway slashing skeletons. I'm not expecting to explore a game like um, like Final Fantasy VIII Root Town or something like that. I don't, you know, That stuff is done in other ways. But here, where I'm supposed to be finding collectibles, finding hidden pieces of information, finding whatever, the fact that I have fixed camera angles bugged me. I found it that I found that not having control of the camera angles made me constantly worried that something was going to be off frame that was going to get me. <clears throat> so I like when you hear something and you can't turn the camera to really look where that sound came from. It made me worried: is that a Wendigo or is it an elk or maybe a wolf? Like what else? Like what other games? Maybe it's a crazy about, like, psycho guy this. with a flamethrower. Like some of the games that kind of did this was, um, was uh, well, I guess we we play we talked about The Last of Us, but not maybe not everybody played it. Uh, Gino, you played it. Tyler, you probably played it, right? Mm-hmm. The Last of Us, and there were parts in that game where you are in a fixed scenario, like you're in like a room, and you have control of the camera angle, but. Everything else is pretty fixed. Like, you can't leave the room. You have to be talking to certain people. You have to be in a certain space until certain plot points get played out. But the camera's not stuck up in the top corner in some isometric view. I don't like that restriction. I feel like it okay, so, took a little bit away from the game. So, Tyler, you... Yeah, you um, I, I had a similar experience, right? My, my explorer impulses were... Um, freaking me out the entire duration of the game because I knew there was one totem that I was missing because I just didn't bother to point my flashlight in every conceivable corner of the room. And the fixed camera angle did make that so annoying that I just didn't want to deal with it after a certain point. But I do like a lot of the stuff they did with it. It tracking, it tracks you in ways that, you know, look like what would be a predatory camera angle a few times. Like, I feel like it did a good enough job of building suspense, like what um, Juno said earlier, that it probably merited its inclusion. Um, It would be giving the player like a completely free, you know, third or first person camera angle um, in this scenario probably would have um, diminished a lot of the tone that they were trying to set. Do you think it would have done more harm than good? 
Yeah, because I think, for example, when Ashley hears a sound off screen, you can see that there is a segment of water that she could go and investigate. If I could turn the camera and look and see if anything's in there, I would know, hey, there's no people over there. I probably shouldn't investigate it. Or, hey, there's a sound that I heard. Let me look over there. Oh, it's an elk. Or maybe they don't have to show it in camera, but feeling like I have control of what I can see and can't see, I think takes away some of that sense of mystery of what's around the corner. And I feel like that might be for the type of cinematic game that they're trying to make where they are controlling the camera angles because, I mean, the, the game's director was a movie director. He sees it in camera angles and how this thing should be presented. Um, I think that it makes sense. The thing that bothered me more than anything was just when I tried to sway the camera left or right or direct the flashlight, I didn't find it speci- uh, especially responsive or useful. Yeah. So I didn't – they advertised – being able to move the camera a little bit more and get a little bit more view, and I didn't find that that was very. Also, I didn't. I didn't impactful. like that if you stood there and did nothing, you just got a face shot. What do you mean? If like you just stood there and did nothing, it would just like zoom in on the character's face. So. Oh really? You, you, you never experienced that? No. If you had character control and you just stood there and did nothing for like five seconds, it would just give you like a extreme close up of their face. Like a Sergio Leone spaghetti western kind of close up. Yeah, like like eye shifty one way or the other. Like, Wait yeah. Uh, Chris was worried with about his faux hawk. Yeah, but then you can like kind of like like control their head and make make them sort of like animate their face. But I think that was just why. I don't know why. Yeah. Ashley was like, I've got leggings and jorts because I'm stylish. My last complaint That's about this look. game ties into what Tyler said about you know our completionist goals and. You might have had some. <laughs> I I might have had completionist goals, but like they were just cheap. Find all the totems and then like play all the like I guess get all the story um not not story, like get all the endings or the best ending. That's about as that's about as completionist as you get. Like maybe find all the clues or snippets of clues, like snippets of paper and stuff. I wasn't happy as a completionist in this game. Well, it's not so, like it's not an RPG. I'm, you can't max your I'm, stats. You're right, but I'm deeply confused about why you, like you, last two weeks ago said that there was story impact of finding all the things in Lara Croft. It was, but most of the collectibles was actually burning posters and like lighting torches. There was story impact, but finding all the things. There's not. The collectibles in this game are nothing but documents for the story and totems that show you future story. That and you can actually then I watch liked. a video that you unlock when you find all the all totems. Right. The videos were minimally helpful. They were probably like one second long at most. And I feel like... There's no impact when you burn a poster. No. It's only one second. When, when I was video, talking about picture. the Laura Croft stuff, I mean, if you found all the all the GPS caches, it paid homage to earlier Lara Croft games. You got like a little piece of bonus content. I'm not, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to go talk about Tomb Raider now. That's the only this is one not what we're here had. for. What I'm talking about I'm... is in this game, what do you get rewarded for finding all this stuff? Maybe all you get is a character not dying and that's good, but you can just get that by passing QTEs instead. I think the solution you're learning is about the world. stop completing shit. Just stop doing it. No, I like to be a completionist. That's my archetype. That's my, what you call that's it. Wh- that's who I that, am. That is who I am. And when they said, hey, you're going to have to replay this game to get the full story. Oh, yes. shit. Fuck yes. No, I'm <laughs> not down for this kind of replay. Yes. I'm not down for this kind of replay because this kind of replay, this kind of replay was nothing more than go back and fix your mistakes. Don't it's do something new. You- it's go back and fix your mistakes, and I don't like that. Let's take Volta Story, a game that I like, for example. I played that game six times now. On one yes. on one on every character, twice on Wyatt, twice on Vladen, right? And in that game, when you replay as a new character, yeah, you fight the same bosses, you you go through the same towns, you go through the same whatever, but they give you different pieces of the story that you would not have gotten otherwise. It's a you don't get story. that. So how are you? I'm really confused about why you think that 
playing through with four different characters in Valda's story and getting different aspects of the story is different than choosing different dialogue options in this game and then having the characters have different relationships depending on which ones you pick. Tyler, you had something. Yeah, well, so I, I feel like the problem here is how the game portrays its collectibles, right? In all of the screens, you have big blank spots where all of the collectibles are supposed to go that are prominently featured in the menus and yeah. have that little video that you they're, just naturally want to complete like that you feel like might three be important. Or four sub yeah. yeah. And the game does specifically tell you that finding um, clues early on will increase your chances of survival, even though it really doesn't. Um, That's pretty so, important that even though it really doesn't bothers yeah. me. Um, but I think that's the big thing is that when the game teases you with them, um, constantly like that does reminds you that you don't have them, then you want them right. And not being able to find them because of the confines of the controls or because you made a wrong decision and you just don't get to play that extra Sam chapter. That's like upsetting to a spe specific type of player, which is Billy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it's just a conveyance problem. Like, if they had only showed you you got X out of how many at the very end or whatever, that might have circumvented it, right? But the fact that it puts it right up there in your face um, drives certain types of players wild, <laughs> myself included. Yeah, I, I didn't like it because... There were some moments where I was upset about collectible stuff was just because... I could see where there was a collectible, but sometimes there are branching paths, and um, I did not realize that I went down the wrong fork in the road, and then when I went down that wrong fork, you know the old video game design thing where there's two, there's a fork in the road, one's going to end in a treasure chest, the other one's going to be the right way to go, and you kind of have to get that feeling of, have I gone far enough away where this is actually the right path? I should probably go down the dead end. Yeah, I know that um, feeling so firmly in my heart as a, as a completionist. I know before there's even a fork which way the treasure is. Yeah, so I sometimes would go down the wrong or the right fork and there would be just a close a point where like a door slams behind you or something you or you open back. a locked door and then you can't go back <sighs> and I've actually that, restarted entire games for that. <laughs> I actually restarted um, Hey, remember that time we did a moment for Billy Silent Moment of I restarted Kingdom Hearts one or two, wh whichever one had the trinities in it. Was it two? Was Kingdom Hearts two? It was, it was one and two. one. Well, okay, one of them had a Halloween Town level, and they they both do. Yeah, but yeah, but one, one of them had a Halloween where you had to like go inside of like a building that became the final boss. You have to go. There's the a building trinity in the That's building, the and one. if you don't get it, you kill the boss and you can't go back. New playthrough. I was like 25 hours in. Restart the game. That's not, it's not, I guess that's something to be proud of. Look. Something that happened. That's, that's, that's how Billy enjoys games. <laughs> let them let him live a cheaper life. To each life. their own. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. To each their own. Look, this game wasn't, the wasn't worst garbage. Like, world I world. said a lot of things that I didn't like. I didn't like the hard left turn after the Josh reveal. And I keep saying hard left turn. It's just like a dramatic shift in what the story was trying to do after the Josh reveal. I didn't, I didn't like that. I didn't like how it had, I think it had internal arguments with how with how it was going to market itself are we going to have adult things like violence and gore but have childish humor i didn't like that i didn't like this collectible system i didn't like this camera angles i had a way impossible time believing and this is part of the horror film trope like hey guys there's a killer on the loose should we leave no it, it it'll be good let's just stick around through the through the night and also let's split up guys so we're not as safe anymore like there are so many times in this game where i think if i was put into this game as a player i would have not tripped on that thing i would have not slipped and fallen and now had to p perform a qte to not get murdered i wouldn't have made yeah. dumb decisions i wouldn't there walk around so in a times. bath towel for two hours while there's a fucking yeah, murderer that, on the loose. Like, no, there's dumb-ass decisions that I just cannot believe would happen. There are so many times when I'm watching Scooby-Doo and I'm like, what are you doing splitting up, you fool? Well, they do the that Harlem every episode, right? Ain't gonna save you. right? The Harlem Globetrotters aren't going to save you. This game would have been a lot better with the Harlem Globetrotters. But there's times <laughs> That's in this the game... Twist. They ha Instead of yeah. Wendigo's Harlem <laughs> Globetrotters, they show They up. should have had the Final Fantasy VIII version of the Wendigo <laughs> where they play basketball. Gino, what's the line from... Futurama, 
where it's Bender talking to the Globetrotters. Like, are you funky enough to be a Globetrotter? Are you funky? Look inside yourself. Well, maybe with are time. Are you funky enough? It's like, are you? No. No. So all the things that I had wrong with this game, they're problems for me. I would give this game, like, I've never given a game, like, a number rating before, but it probably was, like, first time. Five Wendigos out of a four. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it was probably like like a four out of ten or something for me. Like it was probably a four. Like because it was a horror film, basically, it immediately was like a seven at best because I just don't like horror films. And then like they had so much stuff that I had wrong with it that it was. Going to be a four out of seven. No, like it was. It would have been out of ten if it was any. Like it started as ten. It just got minus three for being horror. <laughs> Thank God we're not game reviewers. <laughs> Thank God that this isn't a game Should have reviewer. Right. Advice with that. But thing. then again, some stuff was good. I like that they tried to make me care about the characters. Maybe, maybe they failed, but they tried. Props. I like that there was incredible was graphics in this game. I mean, come on, graphics were beautiful. I like right? the you know, Metacritic score is like eighty. If you're interested. <laughs> I like that there were voice actors who voice acted it. <laughs> Hayden Panettiere is pretty. That's plus two points. Um, Peter Stormara, he's got a crazy name. Actually, <laughs> the guy who plays Chris was in my favorite movie ever. It's called Brick. He played Tug in the movie Brick. He played Tug in Brick? Yeah, if, if Brick. the character who played Chris, I forget his, the actor's name, but if he's listening, man, don't think I've forgotten. I'm still waiting for that next tug performance. I'm sure the brick, brick was guys dope. were all gathered around the computer. <laughs> yeah, there right. was problems, I but I there were redeeming qualities. I think we went to got it. Yeah. Um, Billy said it. So I quit. <laughs> I think that's I think that's Billy's last <laughs> Billy's sign off. Uh, Tyler, last thoughts. Oh yeah, no. I mean, overall, I had a lot of fun with it. It got me into into a genre that I normally would not touch with a 10 foot pole it was absolutely gorgeous and it got me to like walk around like a normal human being as opposed to spring everywhere so that's a plus so when to go yeah. out of 10 it's, it's fair when to go right. out of 10 Pretty good. when to go out of 10 yeah. and and pete did you know that corn can't reproduce on its own either if it weren't for humans Corn would just go extinct in the form it's taken now, which begs the question of whether or not corn has adopted humans as an evolutionary strategy. Hmm. God yeah. damn. Yeah. So you, enlightened. That's a great point. Yep. We'll take that into advisement. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Octopi are people too. True. They can squeeze through any hole big enough to fit their beak. You just you said that last podcast. I, did I? Important fact. <laughs> Just remember it. Just remember it. <laughs> oh, my God. That, I can't handle this. <laughs> this podcast has gone on too long. I know that you're – just know that you're setting expectations to our listeners that you will always have a dumb animal – I mean, amazing animal. They might not always be animals. I could always have an amazing fact, though. Flora or fauna. I got it. I got it. I I'll, think, I'll get a few. I think the octopus thing should just be your sign-off from now on. Just, yeah. just that one every time. Just remember, kids. <laughs> octopus. <laughs> I could fit through all. <laughs> Don't say I didn't warn you. They're coming. Okay, uh, I guess my final thoughts on the game. I enjoyed it overall. I thought it was a pretty faithful representation of teen horror movies. As someone who, my cable, the cable provider that we have at my house had an HD horror channel that all they did was play teen horror movies 24 hours a day. And so I caught a lot of bad, schlocky 80s teen horror movies. And I I saw all of the beats in this one, point for point. And I appreciated the comfort level with that. I think that this game is going to be a Halloween staple, probably. Um, it's pretty good to play with others. It's also a fun game to play multiplayer. Um, and so I think that that's a pretty good achievement. I really disliked that the way that they handled some of the... Um, mental health stuff i thought that peter stormaro was really good i liked some of the stuff that they did with asking the player breaking the fourth wall overall it's you know seven wombat what what is Wendigo. that thing Wendigos. wolverines wolverines in a cupboard oh yeah wolverines in a cupboard yeah. <laughs> it's seven wolverines in a cupboard baby wolverines wolverine just a, a baby wolverine 
out of a mansion. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's a pretty good score. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening. Um, so next time, I wanted to propose a game, because it's my turn. Do it. Undertale. 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 Never heard of PC. it. All right, Undertale. Let's do it. Um, it's a PC game. It has very low system requirements. I've heard nothing <laughs> but good things about Wait, it. Wait, um, Tail is a homophone? So which? Oh, um, T-A-L-E. T-A-L-E. Like a tale, gotcha, like a story. Not a, okay. No, not like... Wagging not like a tail. Not like an appendage. Is it on Steam? No. It is. Okay, also on the Humble Store. But I've heard nothing but good things, and I've seen weird internet meme things about Undertale, and I have no context for what they mean. Let's get some context like up in here. Mean. Let's get some memes. Yep. So, Dank memes. if you want to get in touch... Dank memes incoming. Damn it. So, um, if you want to get in touch with the show, at that pinguino on Twitter, that pinguino at gmail.com, or deeplistens.lips libsyn.com our comment section and feel free to rate and review on itunes you want the five star one it's the good one <laughs> um so thank you once again for listening thank you to all of my lovely guests and billy thank you everyone for listening um, had a good time until dawn was not my favorite but sure it's whatever thank you thank you tyler yeah i had a blast thanks for having me thank you pete thank you once again everybody tune in and to everyone at home, when a good night. God. <laughs> what <Dick>. the shit? <laughs> Peace. <laughs> <laughs>